The body and soul of the main character will be burned by the uncontrollable fire of hell. He will become the sacrifice that will save this world. Today, the main character, surrounded by flames on all sides, will die. Nothing was visible around except the all-consuming fire. In the end, the guy who burned in the flames of hell becomes the most powerful messenger of fire. Sometime earlier, the action took place somewhere on the northern outskirts of the kingdom. The main character was minding his own business near the well when suddenly something hit him painfully right in the head. He turned around in confusion to understand whose hands it was and heard them laughing at him. The offender said, that's where the main character is. Let the Valfleur listen, he is a stranger here. The blonde bully took pleasure in tormenting the others. This was clear from the way he grinned, holding a map engulfed in flames in his hands, and exclaimed, Today they will drive the Valfleur to hell. He clearly has no place in this village, it serves him right. After which all the other guys standing behind him began to attack the Valfleur. A few seconds later, the main offender was already lying on the ground while blood flowed from his nose. The Valfleur apologized to the guys, who were also lying beaten and exhausted on the dusty ground. The Valfleur sat on one of them, completely relaxed and calm. In an orderly tone, he asked not to disturb him, because he still needed to prepare food for the teacher. Despite his condition and loss in the fight, the main offender mockingly said, Freak, what kind of magic is this anyway? The Valfleur asked, He just kicked them, what kind of magic? His teacher teaches this every day, so... He could not finish speaking, because the fair-haired offender guessed and asked, Is he the same one? A magician who likes to swing his fists more. Here's a clown. No wonder, like the teacher, like the student. Then the Valfleur could not stand it, grabbed the beaten hooligan by the collar of his clothes, and lifted him high above him, which frightened the fair-haired guy even more. Then he hissed threateningly, he will not allow anyone to insult his teacher. The offender can say what he wants about the Valfleur, but let this idiot remember it once and for all. He again could not finish, because a familiar voice came from behind, asking what the flyer was doing now. The man looked very angry and displeased, causing the Valfleur to exclaim in fear, teacher. They soon found themselves in the house. The Valfleur put a plate of hot food on the table and said with a stutter, these are steamed potatoes. The teacher asked skeptically, and what are these coals? Continuing to examine the charred food, he asked again for a couple. And how did the student manage to burn it? The Valfleur awkwardly scratched the back of his head, clutching the tray to himself, and replied, well, he didn't have much time, so he hurried a little and... The teacher interrupted the Valfleur's speech and asked in a reproachful tone, but did he have enough time for a fight? The Valfleur put the tray in front of him, as if it could serve as a shield in case of emergency, and awkwardly asked for forgiveness. He thought that now he was scared. Then the teacher abruptly changed the topic and asked his student how the training was going. Has he already completed all the exercises for today? The Valfleur thought for a second and then confidently answered yes. Of course, he practiced magic and also performed 20 sets of 5,000 push-ups and 7,000 abdominal exercises. He remembered how he trained with additional equipment in the form of stones and logs and then added, everything is fair and without cheating. The teacher looked at the wallflower and asked again 20. He said only 10 approaches. The student confirmed yes, it was just easy, so he added. At that second, the teacher hit the table with his fist, causing the plate of potatoes to fly into the air, and exclaimed, the student should not act arbitrarily. The Valfleur covered his face with the tray and shouted, let him be forgiven, he is guilty. The teacher closed his eyes in irritation and frowned in an attempt to calm down. Then he squatted down and began to collect dishes and food that had fallen from the table. The man said, okay, that's enough. His teachings won't help the student anyway. The Valfleur was silent for several seconds, replaying in his head what he had heard, and then asked if something had happened to the teacher. He feels uneasy at the elder's words. Then the man asked, does the Valfleur know about the gates of hell? The student replied, well, he heard about it, sort of. Are they the ones holding back the hellfire that could burn the whole world? It is said that magicians have been monitoring them for over 1,000 years to keep the flames under control. Then the teacher gloomily announced that today, it was decided to sacrifice the Valfleur to this very gate. The teacher remembered a recent meeting. One of the people said, Hellfire is very unstable now. At this rate, the whole world will soon burn to the ground. They need to sacrifice a young magician, as they did in ancient times. This should suppress the strength of the flame. Then the old man raised his hand, pointing to one of those present here and said, His student Valfleur is perfect, isn't it? 
Let the teacher go with him tomorrow morning to the gate so that the Valfleur can sacrifice himself. Returning to the present, the teacher put the plate on the table and said with regret, there are two main reasons. Firstly, the Valfleur has no family, and secondly, he was not originally born in their village. The teacher is very sorry, but these are the rules. It is their duty to protect the world from the flames. And since the Valfleur is a resident of their village, he is obliged to fulfill this. The teacher got up and left the room, finally saying, the ritual is early tomorrow morning, so he advises the student to get some last sleep. Left alone in the room, the Valfleur asked in a colorless voice, does this mean he will die tomorrow? And so the curtain fell on the life of the Valfleur before it really had time to begin. But what's strange is that he wasn't scared at all. He has no family, no friends, he did not expect anything good from life. Life was initially lost, and it was only thanks to the teacher that the Valfleur was able to live to these years. He has nothing to regret. Soon the teacher announced that they had arrived, and here was the gate of hell. Valfleur said, wow, that's even more than he thought. He carefully examined what he saw for the first time in his life. Then the teacher said that hellish flames were sealed in the gate. In general, it looks like an ordinary gate except for its size and the ability to float in the air, of course. It's closed for now, so let the Valfleur open the gate like the teacher taught him. The student immediately agreed and began to do what he was told. He pulled out in front of him a sheet with special symbols depicted on it and cast a spell anti-rowdy blues. The Valfleur then placed his palms against the huge doors and pressed on it, causing circular waves to go out in different directions from his hands. Soon the doors creaked and opened slightly, then swung open completely and released hellish flames outwards. The Valfleur looked at this in surprise, and the teacher said that this flame burns not only the body, but also the soul, so the cycle of rebirth will immediately be interrupted. He fell silent, trying to suppress his emotions. Then the teacher voiced his guess. Perhaps the Valfleur hates him. The student smiled sincerely and asked the teacher not to say that. He is incredibly grateful to him for everything the teacher did for him. The Valfleur is very glad that he was so lucky to meet him. Then the teacher quietly said, that's it. He must leave because the rules prohibit escorting the victim further. The Valfleur replied, well, let the teacher take care of himself. He bowed low to the back of the departing teacher and mentally thanked him for everything. Then he straightened up and turned towards the gate. No doubts, no regrets. He's ready. Then the Valfleur took a few steps forward and said, well, it's time to save the world. As soon as he stepped inside, the door slammed behind him and he was plunged into darkness. The Valfleur turned around in surprise and asked himself, where did the flame disappear to? So what's the matter? Was this all just for show? At that moment, the flames around flared up again, enveloping the Valfleur from all sides. He looked at it with delight and surprise and thought, wow, it's completely different from all the other fire he's seen. The flames seemed different here. Unable to take his eyes off the fire, the Valfleur said how beautiful it was. Suddenly a flame burned his cheek and then completely covered his body. His hand began to crack and his fingers to fall off due to the high temperatures. Soon, Valfleur's entire body began to collapse, causing him to scream in pain incredibly loudly. He thought, what kind of pain is this? This is even stronger than he could have imagined. Hot, incredibly hot. After a while, he looked down, seeing the remains of his body being completely burned. Then the Valfleur looked at himself and exclaimed, his body was completely burned. Is this his soul? He remembered the words of the teacher that the flame ignites not only the body, but also the soul. Does this mean that the Valfleur's suffering is not over yet? The next second he screamed even louder, twitching with his whole body from unbearable pain. He thought, this is what death means. To be honest, the Valfleur regrets what he did. It would be better if he didn't do it. Now he doesn't care what happens to the world, let him be released from here. He did not stop squirming from the endless pain of Hellfire. The Valfleur thought, it seems that the soul is not as easy to burn as the body. And how much longer can he endure this? The sense of time here is completely vague. Will he really have to wait until the next victim arrives? The Valfleur began to crawl on the floor, not knowing how to relieve his suffering. He continued to reason, is this how they contain the fire? Yes, they are kidding me. Valfleur whispered with difficulty, teacher. So he continued to fry in this inferno without the slightest idea of when this pain would go away. He wondered again when he would finally die. The soul still did not want to disappear from this world. It seemed like an eternity had already passed, but over time the Valfleur, lying in all this flame with his arms thrown behind his head and legs crossed, 
came to the realization that he was accustomed to this pain. He whispered, he didn't care. His soul continued to be in an endless stream of fire, but it was no longer as painful as at the beginning. The Valfleur waved his hand in front of his face in an attempt to get at least a little freshness and said, it's hot. It looks like he's been roasting here for too long, resulting in him being able to tame the Hellfire. Then the Valfleur stretched, stretching his soul, and asked, is it okay that he seems to have to be a victim? He completely lost the sense of time. He then vigorously clenched his fist and exclaimed, okay, we need to find out what's interesting here. The Valfleur stood up and looked forward, seeing only fire in front of him. He said, at first he was not interested in this, but what if he finds something? Like treasures or something else? He was tired of sitting and doing nothing. He thought, there is a hole at the top that is not occupied by fire. We should gather higher and look around. After this decision, the Valfleur began to implement his plans. It was as if he had learned to fly thanks to the streams of flame around him. Once above, the Valfleur stopped and thought, in this form you can move anywhere just by the power of thought. Wow, this is incredibly convenient. If you look at it this way, there are flames of various colors burning here. Red, blue, yellow, green, and also purple, black and white. Then the Valfleur noticed a flame of another color, gold. He exclaimed, what a beauty, simply fantastic, so it can be confused with heaven. Suddenly the Valfleur noticed a sparkle in the distance that stood out against the background of all the diversity of fire. He wondered what it was. Then the Valfleur got closer to the unknown object and took the shiny stone in his hands. He exclaimed, wow, there was some kind of red gem inside the flame. Here are the treasures. If he sells it, he can get a lot of money. After a few seconds, consciousness came to the Valfleur, and with awkwardness and slight disappointment, he said, Stop! There are no merchants here. Suddenly, from his hand, which was holding the gem, strange energy began to form in different directions, which made the Valfleur scream. His soul was suddenly covered with something unknown, and after a few seconds it disappeared. The Valfleur looked around himself and wondered what this feeling was. The gem is missing. Then the Valfleur realized, no, it merged with his soul. Apparently, this stone was the fire of hell. Wait, if this is true, does that mean gems are everywhere? He looked around, taking in the different colored flames and the individually shaped stones within. The Valfleur couldn't believe everything that was happening. What was going on? Can he really survive and save the world at the same time? Then he gathered all the gems next to him, touching all the stones at the same time. A powerful blinding flash formed, after which the Valfleur looked at his body and thought it worked. After a few seconds, unbridled joy came over him, causing him to start jumping and shouting, Hooray! He was able to put out the hellfire. He exhaled and thought with relief, he no longer needs to sit here and no one will have to sacrifice himself. Valfleur can live on. You need to tell your teacher everything. Then he looked at the gate, which was still closed. The Valfleur thought, sure, he doesn't have a body, so it's unlikely that he'll be able to get out of here. At that moment, streams of energy began to flow towards the very center of his chest from all sides, which made him wonder what it was. White flame. It enveloped his leg, which suddenly took on a corporeal form. A few seconds later, the Valfleur squatted down and examined his hands, which were now more than just a soul. He thought, wow, the white flame has transformed into real flesh. How does this even work? Is it because the Valfleur was able to absorb it? Then he looked at his hand, on which there were drops of tears. The Valfleur looked at this in surprise, not immediately realizing that he was crying, even if he didn't want it. He asked, where are the tears coming from? It wouldn't be cool to show up in the village like this. The Valfleur began to quickly wipe his cheeks and hide all traces of the fact that he had just cried. Then he touched the door with his hand and thought he was already ready to die here. But how glad he was that he survived in the end. The Valfleur pressed hard on the gate, wanting to open it. What should he do upon his return? First you need to eat well. I wonder if the teacher will be very surprised. Valfleur wants to see his expression. How happy he is. He has no time to rush. He will decide what to do next when he returns back with the teacher. Suddenly the Valfleur looked at the horse's hoof, which was approaching his face, and asked what. Then he noticed a large crowd of robbers who were running with swords, axes, and spears, rushing forward with mad smiles. The chief of the people, sitting on a horse, shouted, their victims must not be allowed to escape from the forest. Let the others move. Let those turtles keep up. The backside of the gate was dirty and trampled. The Valfleur opened the door more forcefully and asked displeasedly what that noise was. What kind of men are these? He crawled out naked and said he almost died, although he had just been resurrected. 
Then the Valfleur turned around and said, Wait, how did these people get past the gate? He saw that the gate was no longer floating in the air, as it had been before, but was lying on the ground under the roots of mighty trees. The Valfleur asked in bewilderment, Did the gates fall? He ran his finger along the door, seeing traces of his touches. The Valfleur said everything was overgrown with moss, and the gate itself was also shabby. Maybe there was some kind of storm that blew the gate outside the village. He just doesn't recognize this place at all. The Valfleur looked around, seeing a huge number of unfamiliar trees in front of him, which made him wonder if he had definitely returned back. After some time spent thinking, the Valfleur said, There's not a soul here. Okay, first he needs to get to the village, but where should he go? Then the Valfleur exclaimed, Exactly. Those men definitely must know something. And so his second life began. He ran through the forest, completely naked, and shouted, He can still keep up with those men. Faster. Everything was not without difficulties, of course, but it's okay, he can handle it. After some time, one of the robbers exclaimed, Here they have found them. Two girls stood between the thick roots of a mighty tree. One of them, with tears in her eyes, was hiding behind the second dark-haired girl, who was gritting her teeth angrily and holding a sword in front of her as a defense. Then the chief of the robbers waved his hand and said, They will no longer escape in their car. Let the girls accept their fate and not do anything unexpected. A man with a scar on his face and a disgusting grin added, They shouldn't be afraid, it won't hurt. Then the girl standing in front exclaimed, They are freaks. Valfleur observed everything that was happening from the side, hiding behind the bushes next to the robber's horse. He thought, he certainly caught up with the men, but it seems they have more important things to do. So what should he do now? Should I leave them and look for someone else? This is a bad idea, because there is no guarantee that there are any people in this forest other than them. His teacher prepared him for this. If you ask politely, then someone in need will definitely be helped. After thinking about this, the Valfleur decided to ask and move on. The main thing is to show respect. Then he asked for forgiveness, which attracted the attention of everyone present. The Valfleur ran out of the bushes, completely ignoring the fact that he had no clothes on, and asked, can he ask them for directions? The brave girl covered the second girl's face and exclaimed loudly, let her close her eyes and not look. Within a second, sharp weapons were pointed at the Valfleur's body from all sides. The chief of the robbers threw his sword over his shoulder and asked what kind of pervert this is, is he a friend of those girls? The Valfleur immediately began waving his arms in different directions and saying, no, no, he just got lost here. Then the main man asked, are you lost in the forest? Naked? Does he even trust himself? Valfleur answered awkwardly, well, so much has happened. The man did not listen, he just exclaimed, let the others kill this strange man. Then the Valfleur swore loudly and hit one of the robbers in the face with all his might, exclaiming, he just wanted to ask for directions. How can they not understand? It took him only a few seconds to scatter his opponents in different directions and render them unconscious. The dark-haired girl did not understand how he was able to defeat a thug twice his size with just one blow. She quietly asked what? Someone angrily said who he is. The Valfleur put on the clothes of one of the robbers and said displeasedly, they must listen to what they are told. He will take the clothes for himself. Then another of the robbers exclaimed, he is a freak. Valfleur beat them. Then they will fall on him all together. At the moment when the bald, huge man swung his weapon at the Valfleur, he harmlessly raised his palms in front of him and said, stop, stop, stop. He didn't want to fight them in the first place. The Valfleur didn't even turn around, kicking the goon right in the jaw, breaking his hammer in the process. He exclaimed, he didn't want to fight at all. Then one of the hooligans asked why he fought if he didn't want to. The Valfleur smiled awkwardly and replied, they just misunderstood him. This is self-defense. His words had no effect at all on the robbers, who continued to try to attack the Valfleur. He deftly dodged the saber and asked, they don't want to listen to him then. Okay. And then he began to beat them again, spilling other people's blood and perfectly avoiding the blows. He exclaimed, the Valfleur will find the way himself. Suddenly, he turned around and looked at the two girls who continued to remain in the same place. The blonde stranger covered her mouth with her hands and exclaimed, wow. The girl standing in front of her said, he's fast. Then the chief of the robbers stomped loudly, showing his dissatisfaction with what was happening. He asked, is this guy a monster? The Valfleur at that moment stood with his back to the enemy and examined his body. He thought, now he is in even better shape than before. But what is this strange feeling? It was as if something new had appeared inside him. At this time, the man swung his hammer and jumped, intending to hit the wallflower with all his might. 
he exclaimed. Let this freak not be arrogant. His attack was not destined to come true. The Valfler turned around in time and said, that's it. Suddenly, the dark-haired girl hit the bully from behind, causing him to fall to the ground. His body began to bleed heavily, and he was no longer able to continue the fight. Valfleur looked at the tired stranger and thought, did this girl save him? He awkwardly scratched the back of his head and said with a friendly smile, she saved his life and he was grateful for that. The Valfleur thought he could have done it alone, oh well. At that second, the girl put the end of her sword to the Valfleur's neck and ordered him not to come near. And no, she didn't save him. The Valfleur took a frightened step back, fearing for his life. The girl continued to scream, she just weighed her priorities, but for now she doesn't trust the Valfleur. Let him answer who he is and what he is doing here. If he lies, he won't leave here alive either. The second blonde girl, dressed in a fluffy dress, sat on the ground near a tree trunk and closed her eyes, thinking, this guy has everything in sight. The Valfleur thought, the dark-haired girl is hostile, but apparently you can talk to her. Then he said his name and said that he was from the northern village, which is located on the outskirts of the kingdom. He got a little lost and now doesn't know how to get back. The girl was surprised to hear this answer and asked, Did he say northern village? The Valfleur exclaimed joyfully, Yes. Does she know this? How lucky he was. Could the girl show him the way? Instead of an improved relationship, the dark-haired stranger swung a sword, the tip of which was so close to the Valfleur's head that it cut off his hair. He collapsed to the ground and exclaimed in irritation, What's wrong with her? Then the girl replied he thinks she would believe him. The Valfleur continued to sit on the ground and wonder what. What is she talking about? The girl still held the sword, pointed towards the Valfleur. She said she sees what's on his mind. Did he want to fool her? As long as she, the sacred knight named Aesir, stands on her feet, no one will lay a finger on the innocent princess. Valfleur asked again Aesir. So is that her name? The second girl is a princess. He is very pleased to meet you. At this moment, the seemingly harmless stranger loudly exclaimed, Aesir is completely stupid. The princess asked not to call her that. Then Aesir fell on top of the wallflower and exclaimed, He planned all this, the freak. The Valfleur was confused, but still managed to grab the blade of the sword in time, which was pointed directly at him. He screamed in fear, what? What's happening? Aesir replied, Valfleur now knows who they are, and he will have to die. The Valfleur was indignant, she told him everything herself. Then the princess intervened, pushing Aesir in the back and ordering her to stop. Let her put away her sword. What is Aesir even doing? He saved their lives. Aesir tried to start an argument, princess. He's some kind of psycho. The Valfleur continued to sit on the ground and be indignant. He said, let the Aesir look at herself. After this, the knight could no longer defend her position and asked for forgiveness. The Valfleur rolled his eyes displeasedly and wondered what was happening to them. Then he got up and walked in the other direction. He thought these girls were absolutely clueless, and he would figure it out somehow on his own. Aesir exclaimed displeasedly, where did this freak run? The princess sincerely asked the Valfleur to stop because she wanted to ask him for something. At that moment, behind them, one of the robbers regained consciousness, but now he looked many times more insane and frantic. Aesir turned around and mentally cursed, she needed to hit the enemy harder. She asked the princess to be careful, then the robber exclaimed, that's all. He will kill at least one, let her die. His attack was aimed at the princess, but Aesir managed to cover it with her body in time. The Valfleur did not want to stay away from this fight. He took the sword and ran forward, shouting, where did the man go? At the same time, he called himself stupid and wondered why the Valfleur was doing this. His body began to move on its own. He looked at the huge enemy who put his sword forward and asked himself what to do now. There's simply no chance. He cannot dodge and is unlikely to be able to block such a blade. There is nothing to do, you will have to catch the weapon. The Valfleur put his palm forward, preparing to catch the tip of the blade when suddenly his hand was covered in flames, which made him exclaim, what is happening? At this moment, many flashes formed, which made the princess scream in fear and cover her ears, and also close her eyes so as not to see what was happening. In a second, it became hot and dusty around. Aesir covered herself with her hands, saving herself from unnecessary injuries, but continuing to monitor the situation through narrowed eyes. The most painful thing in this situation was the robber, who was completely engulfed in fire. He screamed, it's hot. Oh no, he's a freak. The man was unable to finish his sentence due to the shock of seeing his sword completely melted and destroyed. Aesir exclaimed loudly, princess. She is alright. The blonde princess quietly whispered the name Aesir. 
The robber continued not to understand what was happening and tried to ask what he was. Shock prevented him from finishing his thought, however, in the end, he loudly exclaimed, What is he anyway? Valfleur at that moment was engulfed from head to toe in flames of red, orange, and yellow. He himself was surprised by everything that was happening and did not understand how to control the situation. Aesher hugged the princess, who said in disbelief, his body was enveloped in flames. Aesher also observed the situation and said, he melted the sword in a second. Is this really hellfire? The knight couldn't believe what she was seeing with her own eyes. Valfleur himself did not understand how exactly, but he managed not only to overcome the pain of Hellfire, but also learned to control it. He clenched his fist and whispered, this is hot. The Valfleur with an outstretched palm stood in front of the robber, who was lying on the ground and could not understand who this stranger was. The princess said, Aesher, this guy is the truth. She could not finish, as the knight interrupted her speech and confidently voiced her thoughts, this is a strange flame, so there can be no mistake. This is the hellfire of the shamans of the north. Then she asked hesitantly, but is this possible? The Valfler himself could not find answers to all the questions that were now filling his head. He didn't know that after he was burned in hellfire, he became the most powerful messenger of fire. After some time, when the fire around his body disappeared and turned into steam, the Valfleur looked at his palms and asked himself, what was that just now? What happened to him? He remembered what he felt at the moment when he touched all the gems and thought, this is a strange feeling. Is it really hellfire? Is it all about the gems he absorbed inside the gate? Valfleur, not believing his own words, whispered that flame is now inside him. He was distracted from his thoughts by the robber who grabbed his burnt hand, ran forward and shouted, let someone save him. There's a monster here. The Valfleur turned around in confusion and asked what? Stop. He could not finish, because at that moment Aesher put her sword to his neck and loudly ordered him not to move. Who is he? Why does he wield Hellfire? The princess ran forward, hoping that the Aesher would not harm the Valfleur. At that moment he exclaimed, he knew it. Do they know something? Let them help him if it's not difficult for them. He needs to return to the village where this flame was sealed. Aesher did not want to listen to him. She once again interrupted his speech and screamed loudly. Again, he was mocking them. At that second, the princess hit Aesher on the cheek with all her might, causing the knight to fly to the side. The princess exclaimed, this is impossible. Stupid Aesher, let her stop getting into fights at every turn. The princess began to hit Aesher, who awkwardly asked her to stop several times without success. The princess turned to the Valfleur and with a friendly smile asked to allow her to express her deep gratitude for the fact that Mr. Valfleur saved their lives twice. Her name is Primavera. She is the seventh princess of the White Pearl Kingdom. She asks the Valfleur to simply call her Prima. Aesher began to be indignant, princess. She's too frank with him. Valfleur watched this and thought, is this girl really a princess? Prima exclaimed dissatisfied, this is called sincerity. She orders Aesher to apologize for her rude behavior. Overcoming all her reluctance and stepping over her pride, Aesher clenched her fists and turned to the Valfleur and then hesitantly asked for forgiveness. The Valfleur only answered in embarrassment, okay, then turned to the princess and said, he doesn't really understand what's going on, but he's glad they're okay. Prima came closer to him and emotionally asked Mr. Valfleur for forgiveness. He smiled friendly and said that you can contact him simply as a flyer. Prima put her fists to her chest and said, then she has a request to Mr. Fleer, could he become her bodyguard? The request he heard took the Valfleur a little by surprise, and the Aesir turned out to be dissatisfied with everything that was happening. She exclaimed loudly, Princess. Prima calmly folded her hands on her chest and explained that those mercenaries probably wouldn't leave them alone. Therefore, the more allies they have, the better. Aesir continued to insist on her opinion and exclaimed, she is against it. Traveling with a stranger is dangerous. The Valfleur scratched his cheek with his finger, deciding not to respond to this. Aesir continued to exclaim, besides, the princess does not understand at all. Prima asked in surprise, what? Aesir exclaimed with a crazy look and great rage. She doesn't realize how beautiful a creature Prima is. As soon as her male peers see her, they will immediately begin to try to pounce on her body blooming with youth at any opportunity. This is completely understandable. How can you keep your sanity when such a beautiful princess is right next to you? Even she constantly has to restrain her lust with all her might. Aesir did not pay any attention to what was happening, concentrating only on her speech. The Valfler leaned over to Prima and asked if it seemed to her that she would be in danger with Aesir. 
The princess answered annoyed, she was just thinking about the same thing. At that second, Aisher grabbed the Valfleur by the collar of her clothes and exclaimed, Idiot. Did he even decide to refuse the princess who sincerely asked him? The Valfleur shouted, She really is absolutely stupid. The princess tried to stop the knight and exclaimed, Aisher, that's enough. Let her stop disgracing them. Prima pushed Aisher to the ground and ordered her to sit down. The Valfleur turned away, continuing to watch the girls out of the corner of his eye, and said that he had not given up completely. First he needs to go to the northern village. He entered the gates of hell as a sacrifice, but did not die. On the contrary, having absorbed all the hellish flames, he was able to go outside and no longer needs to guard the gate. He should quickly tell everything to the teacher. Aesher listened to all this and got angry again, exclaiming, Again, he's doing his thing, you freak. Prima calmly answered, she believes that Mr. Fleer is not lying. But if this is so, then all the more she must tell him the cruel truth. The Valfleur came closer and clarified, is it cruel? Then they all stood up, and the princess said he was already in the northern village right now. The Valfleur asked in confusion, what? What does she mean? Is the village right here? He doesn't remember there being a forest here at all. Then Aesher, with a dissatisfied face, explained, to be more precise, this is the place where the village used to be. All the shamans of the north have been dead for a thousand years. The Valfleur could not believe what he was just being told. He asked in shock, what? So, his wonderful second life began with a big problem, or to be more precise, with a complete disaster. Valfleur said, how is this even possible? Sometime later, Prima and Aesher told the Valfleur about many things. While he was in the gates of hell, entire eras changed outside, and all the shamans of his native village died. It was hard for him to believe all this. Aesher put her hand to her face and said, she was amazed, however. She is referring to the shaman's existence within the gates of hell. Aesher believed that this was another dubious legend, but who would have thought that this same shaman survived? Prima turned to her and exclaimed, let Aesher choose the words. He is right in front of them. The Valfleur was sitting on a fallen tree in an incomprehensibly, slightly devastated state. It turned out to be harder to accept what I heard than one could imagine. The princess awkwardly folded her hands in front of her and said that she could guess what Mr. Gour Fleur was feeling right now. She doesn't even know what to say. These words made Valfleur return to reality and ask what. He feels bad for not listening. The princess waved her hands in different directions and tried to find words, but instead she spoke abruptly, but what is this? How? Aesher turned out to be more collected and returned to scolding the wallflower. It's as if his native village was destroyed and he sits here as if nothing had happened. The Valfleur waved his hand negatively and said, not really. A whole millennium passed, it was as if he had entered another world. And if you think about it, the residents still didn't like him. He doesn't even know why. The only person dear to him sacrificed him to the gate. He doesn't really remember the village, so he doesn't miss it too much. The Valfleur is surprised, but he's not even sad. Aesher commented, he's just a callous sea biscuit. Then the Valfleur smiled and said, well, since he suddenly had free time, he can help Prim. The princess folded her hands in front of her chest and exclaimed, really, thank him very much. Aesher was still unhappy with the situation. She clenched her fists and thought, their escape with the princess is now just the two of them. The knight did not finish her thought as she began to mentally curse the Valfleur. He wasn't friendly towards her either. Then the Valfleur said, by the way, he never left the village. He would like to see the world beyond these borders. Prima smiled joyfully and suggested that we first get out of the forest. Aesher, again showing her displeasure, exclaimed, let him just try to slow him down with the princess. Soon, the Valfleur once again used Hellfire, because of which he was enveloped in fire, however, this did not cause him pain. He tried to concentrate on what was happening so as not to suddenly cause trouble. The princess exclaimed, this is amazing, Mr. Fleer. She was hiding behind Aesher, who said, who could have imagined such a use of this terrifying flame? The knight meant that the Valfleur was now using this to clear the way for them through the bushes, thickets, and trees. He turned around and said, he doesn't have much control over the flames yet, but if you learn how to handle it, then the Hellfire can become quite a useful thing. The princess, sitting on someone else's back, said Aesher, she can walk herself. The knight, not wanting to stop her guardianship over Prima for a second, exclaimed, she will not allow the princess's feet to step on the soot-strewn road. She won't let her go for anything. Aesher was having a hard time, as evidenced by the flow of drool from her mouth and a thin stream of blood from her nose. 
Prima exclaimed, Aesir, what an abomination, her terrible drool. The Valfleur was lost in thought. He doesn't feel like he's back at all. Even the news about the death of his teacher did not really upset him. Maybe he really is, as Aesir said, a stale cracker. Prima, continuing to sit on someone else's back, voiced her thoughts, Mr. T. Fleer looks a little drooping. Then she hastened to explain, of course, he suddenly found himself completely alone, and there was no trace left of his native village. He can't even indulge in memories. And why didn't Prima immediately understand what was in his heart now? She's so selfish. Aesir said emotionlessly, maybe you shouldn't worry so much? The knight thought, the caring princess is still as beautiful. Then she added, everything will be fine. At least you can't tell from the Valflora that he's some kind of weakling. They've been walking for about an hour. Even her breathing began to get out of whack. But for him, at least something. All this time, the Valflora carried on his back a bag of essentials, which the girls took when escaping. It weighs much heavier than the princess. But even despite this, the Valfleur did not sweat. And he's been paving the way for them all this time. This guy is clearly not that simple. The princess leaned forward a little, saying in a muffled voice, Aesir. The Valfleur had been silent all this time, but now he turned around and asked when they would leave the forest. They're taking a long time. Aesir stopped and asked, confused, what? What is he talking about? The Valfleur himself went forward clearing the way, so it is obvious that he knows the way. There was silence between them for a few seconds, which was interrupted by a deafening scream from Aesir. Jerk, so he was walking stupidly forward all this time. The Valfleur hastened to justify himself, he just thought that they knew where to go. And since they were silent, he decided that he was going in the right direction. Prima said that initially they ended up in this forest, only because they were hiding from pursuit, so they have absolutely no bearings here. She mentally apologized for this. The Valfleur said in disappointment, it means they were all lost together. He thought, couldn't he have said it before? Prima looked at the sky and began to think out loud. Moreover, most likely due to the fact that shamans lived here in ancient times, this forest itself emits a strong magnetic field, so a compass is also useless here. Aesir could not stand it and exclaimed furiously, Freak, this is his native area. Let him find a way out of the situation. The Valfleur began to argue. He already said, everything around has changed, so what does she want from him? Then he began to climb the trunk of a mighty tree and said, okay, he will climb higher and look for the way out of the forest. He's already tired of them. Aesir let the princess off her back and exclaimed, let him move. Prima watched the Valfleur climb up and thought, wow, the tree is so tall. Soon he climbed to the very top, looked around and said, well, this forest is huge. The end of the edge is not visible. So, going at random would be stupid. Suddenly, he noticed something that caught his attention and made him surprised. Prima put her palms to her mouth so that she could be heard better and shouted, Mr. Fleer, does he see anything? Aesir also shouted in a commanding tone, let him answer. Valfleur replied, he sees the house. Prima asked again, is it home? Does anyone live in this forest? Then the Valfleur said, no, this house is over 1,000 years old. He won't confuse this with anything because this is his and his teacher's home. The Valfleur looked at the familiar and familiar building, surrounded on all sides by dense forest. Soon all three approached the house. The Valfleur walked ahead of the others, carefully stepping on the grass and peering into the building. A few seconds later, Aesir said, this house is really the only one that has survived here from that time. The structure, which is more than 1,000 years old, has been preserved almost in its original form. It's incomprehensible. The princess asked interestedly, is this really Mr. Fleer's house? He replied that it seems that this house was preserved thanks to the magic of the teacher. Then he mentally wondered, but for what? Then Prima voiced her guess. Maybe his teacher left this house for him on purpose. The Valfleur denied the idea. The teacher had no way of knowing that he would survive and return here. Then Aesir decisively said, if they stand here like that, they won't find out anything. They will go inside and assess the situation. The knight took a few steps forward, but Prima grabbed her long hair, thereby preventing her from moving, and exclaimed, Aesir, place. She hugged the knight to her and politely asked Mr. Fleer to come in. They are not so tactless as to step into the territory of other people's memories. The Valfleur awkwardly scratched the back of his head and said, Okay, nothing like that, really. He wasn't sad at all. Prima exclaimed, Mr. Fleer, she seriously can't help the fact that all this time she notices how hard it is for him. They'll wait outside. She would like him to become their comrade without any regrets. The Valfleur carefully walked inside the building, seeing the chaos in front of him. 
The wooden table was covered with a torn tablecloth, and a chair and broken dishes lay nearby. Thalfleer looked at the ceiling covered with cobwebs and said, as expected, the interior is in ruins. Although for 1,000 years, it's probably quite good. Kitchen, here he prepared food for the teacher. Thalfleur caught himself thinking that he was nostalgic. Then he touched one of the walls with his hand and said, and when the food was all burned, the teacher gave him a good beating. Until the very end, the Valfleur never bothered to receive even one praise from the teacher. He suddenly remembered how, when he was a very small child, his teacher trained him. The flood of memories made my soul even more sad than before. The Valfleur asked why the teacher didn't even try to stop him that day. He recalled the moment when he stood in front of the entrance to the gates of hell. Suddenly, a roar was heard from behind, which made the Valfleur very scared. He turned around and looked at the fallen ladle, and then said, damn, he almost died from fear. The Valfleur had already thought that the teacher had risen from the dead. It's just a ladle. Suddenly his gaze was drawn to a book lying under a layer of garbage. The Valfleur thought there was something under the floor, and then he took it in his hands. And suddenly he realized, this is the teacher's diary. Is it okay if he watches it? The Valfleur dusted off the book and opened it with the thought that he had never seen a teacher have a diary. The Valfleur began to read, the teacher wrote, he could not do anything for this boy. The Valfleur said that he would enter the gates of hell, that he would use his only life not for himself, but to give it up for the sake of the village, for the sake of the whole world. Valfleur is a very kind guy. The teacher believed that he had to stop him at all costs. 1,000 years ago, at a meeting, when it was decided who exactly would be sacrificed, the teacher loudly slammed his palm on the table and exclaimed, he cannot understand. Why Valfleur? Their decision must be extremely thoughtful. A young man's only life is at stake. Other people replied, Valfleur doesn't have a single relative, so no one will mourn him. Besides, this boy's bad behavior brings nothing but harm to the village. From the very beginning, he was a stranger to everyone, therefore, it is better to give his life than the life of one of them. The teacher widened his eyes in shock and whispered, unthinkable. They let him take the Valfleur as a child so that, the man was not allowed to finish, as the other man said, in any case, everything has already been decided. The teacher must sacrifice his student to the gates of hell. It was further written that the teacher could not save his dear student, his beloved son. He asks the Valfleur for forgiveness. The last lines of the diary were blurred by tears. Nevertheless, deep down in his soul, the Valfleur harbored a grudge against the teacher. He thought that the teacher had abandoned him, but that was not the case at all. The teacher took care of him until the very end. At the moment when the Valfleur bowed before him for the last time, right a few seconds before entering the gates of hell, the man was already crying. Now, most of the teacher's diary was repentance for the Valfleur. Suddenly he said, stop, and then flipped through a few more pages and realized that the diary did not end there. After a while, he pulled aside one of the dresser drawers and looked inside. He recently read in his diary that now the gloves and armor that the teacher made for his student using magic have become completely useless. The teacher wanted to give this to him when the Valfleur could defeat him for the first time. Now the student looked at the chest and whispered, he found it. It was a set of magical armor called Chaos. The diary entries continued. The teacher wrote that sometimes he dreams. In this dream, the boy suddenly returns home. Obviously this is impossible, but shamans are the ones who can work miracles. The teacher will believe and wait for the Valfleur. The student had already put on the armor, saying in a whisper, teacher. The man wrote, he prays that his student survives and that nothing limits him. The Valfleur clenched his fist tightly and then walked towards the entrance of the building. The teacher wanted his student to see many things in this world that he had never seen before. Aesher and Prima looked in surprise at the Valfleur who came out of the building. In addition to all of the above, the teacher hoped that his student would make new friends. The Valfleur stopped and showed off his new clothes with the words, that's all. The final note was the teacher's desire for the student to live his life freely and happily. Now he spread his arms to the sides and asked, cool, right? Prima replied, Mr. Fleer looks great. Aesher said, clothes make a person. Now the Valfleur at least looks more decent. Then he thanked the Prima, who asked in surprise, for what? He replied that thanks to the princess pushing him in the right direction, he had cleared up a lot of things for himself. It feels like the Valfleur has become truly free. Prima was embarrassed and answered with a smile, yes, she is very happy. Then she will ask again, just in case, does the Valfleur mind if they become his comrades? He smiled back and said, why not? 
Aesir screamed in surprise, what? Let him not even dare to be so familiar with the princess, Aklamin. Prima displeasedly asked Aesir to finally calm down. Suddenly, there was a crunching sound, after which the house literally collapsed to the ground, turning into a heap of ruins. Aesir covered Prima with herself and asked, Why did the house suddenly fall apart? Valfleur guessed that the seal placed on the house was removed as soon as it fulfilled its purpose. All this time, the teacher believed that he would return. Then he bowed deeply and mentally sincerely thanked the teacher for everything he had done for him. He goes on a journey, having gained a chance for a second life with great difficulty. And this time, the Valfleur is going to devote this life to himself. He smiled joyfully and said, Well, go ahead. Thus began his journey with the princess and the crazy girl knight. He has entered an unfamiliar world, so their adventure begins. Aesir turned to him and asked, So what? Where will they go? They never knew how to get out of here. At that second, the Valfleur was confused. It completely slipped his mind. After some time, Aesir screamed loudly while the princess sat on her back and urged her on. Prima said, a little more, and they will become dinner for this giant boar. At this time, a huge animal, several times larger than them, was madly running after the girls behind, breaking everything in its path. Damn it, what's wrong with this forest? The Valfleur resolutely exclaimed, let them trust him. The princess turned around and said in surprise, Mr. Fleer. He stood directly in the path of the mad boar, and then used hellfire again, loudly shouting, let it fail. After a little time, Aesir let Prima off her back and exclaimed, Princess, is she safe? Prima replied, yes, everything is fine, thank you. The remnants of the hellfire were still in the hands of the Valfleur, who called out to the girls and asked how they were doing. Prima thanked Mr. Fleer too. He replied, everything is fine, he is their comrade. Then Aesir approached him and exclaimed furiously, let him do something with the power of his burner. What if he hit the princess? All that was left of the huge boar were bones, charred and covered in fire. The Valfla responded to the complaint that he heard, because of the adrenaline during the battle, it is difficult to control the strength. He thought that he would need to practice. The princess said it seems like they will never be able to get out of this forest, it's some kind of nightmare. Aesir exhaled tiredly and said, even though they dealt with the pursuers, the situation is close to hopeless. Although, if she and the princess die together, she won't care. On the contrary, she is only for such a convergence of events. Prima turned away and asked the knight to close her mouth. Then the Valfler asked, by the way, what is the purpose of their journey? Princess, this is not a random person from the mountain. Why does she expose herself to such a risk? Prima whispered thoughtfully, and that was true. Since Mr. Flyer is now her comrade, then she must tell him. Her older brothers and sisters are hunting for her. The Valfleur asked in surprise, brothers and sisters. Aesir joined the conversation and hastened to explain, since the current monarch of the White Pearl Kingdom is now ill, there is a struggle between the heirs for the throne in the palace. The Valfleur whispered thoughtfully, that's it. So, Prima's brothers and sisters are going to kill her so that she doesn't accidentally sit on the throne. They even sent mercenaries after her. Prima whimpered and answered yes. Aesir noticed a change in her mood and exclaimed, Has the Valfleur become completely insolent? The sad fate of the princess cannot be compressed into one sentence. Prima concluded with tears in her eyes, therefore, she had no choice but to leave her country. She really doesn't need this throne, so why then? The princess did not finish speaking because of her emotions, but the Valfleur came to the conclusion, it seems that everything is very confused there. Well, it looks like Prima is starting her new life too. The princess asked, puzzled, what? The Valfleur continued with a smile, so let her not make such a sour face, but go through life with a smile and pleasure. Like the Valfleur himself, Prima stopped crying and whispered with delight in her eyes, Mr. Fleer. Thank you, he is such a kind gentleman. Valfleur asked her to stop calling him Mr. and call him just Fleur. The princess exclaimed, she understood. Aesir was again unhappy, she got angry and called him Flyer. He's flirting with the princess. The Valfleur asked in confusion, what? Aesir pointed her finger at him and exclaimed, since he has time to chat, it would be better if he had already found a way for them to get out of the forest. Prima grabbed her head and exclaimed, that's right, what will they do? Will they really stay here for the rest of their lives? The Valfleur came to his senses and said about this, it seems that there was one magical thing here that he learned from the teacher. This could help them. His words interested the girls and he continued, this shows a way out when a person is lost, something like that. Prima looked at the Valfleur enthusiastically, is this possible? 
He scratched his head and replied, he too is to some extent a shaman. Somehow he forgot about it. Aesir shouted, why doesn't he ever say important things first? Prima asked the gentleman to help them. The Valflor picked up the sheet with a spell and thought, first he needs to concentrate and then clearly imagine what he needs. Then he threw the sheet and exclaimed, exit. Where is this unfortunate exit? The leaf began to twist, leaving behind a trace. Then the Valflor said, this snake-like pointer moves thanks to his magic. This will lead them to the exit from the forest. The princess exclaimed, go crazy. Then Aesir said less emotionally, magic is a useful thing, the Valflor won't say anything. Can he do anything else? He replied that he had the power to cast spells called diarrhea, stomach ulcers, internal bleeding, migraine, fever, and the like. Aesir asked what kind of vile set is this? Suddenly, danger was felt nearby, which attracted the knight's attention. Prima noticed the changed atmosphere and said in surprise Aesir. Then the knight asked the princess not to move, and then asked the Valfleur, does he remember? The Valfleur replied, he remembers, he still remembers. Monsters are approaching. Three goblins appeared in front of them, with nasty grins. Aesir said that it's easy to deal with monsters alone, but with a crowd you'll have to work a little harder. Nothing surprises her in this forest anymore. Valfleur said that he had already seen goblins. Since these creatures often found themselves near the village, he would deal with them. Aesir ordered him not to dare do this. His fire is too strong. She can handle this nonsense on her own. The Valfleur replied, that's why he wants to practice on them. Aesir did not listen to him, she exclaimed. He is not the only comrade of the princess. The knight then began to attack the goblins with her sword. The princess exclaimed, Aesir, good luck to her. The Valfleur scratched the back of his head in confusion and replied, well, okay, he will work as magical support. Then he thought, magic for sure. Aesir thought, these creatures are much more complex than she expected. At that moment, one of the goblins began to jump right at her, causing the knight to start cursing. Fortunately, a Valfleur got into the fight in time and exclaimed Aesir, it seems she almost got it. He deftly dealt with one of the goblins, which angered the others even more. Aesir screamed, you freak. Why is he climbing? She has everything under control. He argued, he actually saved her skin. The Valfleur formed flames around his hands and said with a grin, now he wants to try out one move. Huge goblins approached with spying chilling laughter and sharp teeth. Waffles stood closest to the monsters, holding out his hand, engulfed in fire. Aesir was behind him and asked, should he try the reception? They were just discussing that his fire was too strong and the Valfleur could hit the princess. He turned around and calmly replied, he knows. If he kept the hellfire under control, then everything would be fine, so don't let her worry. It's hard to control fire on your own, so he'll try to do it with magic. Let them just watch. At this moment, both goblins ran forward, wanting to carry out an attack. But at that moment, the Valfleur summoned hellfire, which is why he was enveloped in fire and mentally ordered them to burn. The goblins retreated in horror, seeing a flash of flame in front of them. Aesir watched this and thought, the Valfleur looks the same as when she first met, but that time he couldn't control the hellfire at all. The Valfleur explained that the whole point is to control the fire like magic. One must imagine how he controls the materialized flame with the help of magical power. You need to concentrate, not release the fire all at once, but direct it to one point. Then he exclaimed, fiery vestment. And then the flames enveloped him on top with a second layer, as if it were clothing. The Valfleur looked at his hands and was delighted, wow, he did it. It looks like he can now control his flames perfectly. Prima ran forward and exclaimed, Aesir. The knight turned to her and said, Princess. At this time, the Valfleur looked at the goblins and spoke, so it's time to start the tests. Now it's his turn. He ran forward, raising his fist to strike, causing the goblins to tense up. The next second, he hit one of the monsters with great force. Aesir stood aside and said in surprise, This is speed. She can't believe it. Prima whispered, unbelievably, going with him was the right decision. The Valfleur continued to fight. From the looks of it, the flames around his fist are quite high in temperature. The goblin who had just been punched lost his skin because it burned. The Valfleur looked at the second monster and exclaimed, Freak, if it's a good boy, he'll let him live. If not, then it will be the same as with that monster. The second goblin was unwilling to retreat, only scowling furiously and deciding to attack another target. He noticed the innocent princess and ran towards her, waving his weapon and giggling disgustingly. The Valfleur turned around in surprise as the monster ran past him. At that second, the Aesir put the sword in front of him and asked, 
Did the goblin think they were easy prey? Let it die. She wounded the goblin, who was sent flying by the blow. Aesir said seriously, she will not allow anyone to touch the princess while she is alive. The monster fell to the ground, and blood gushed out of its chest. Suddenly, the Valfleur grabbed the goblin, preventing him from moving, and exclaimed, Well done, Aesir. The knight was surprised, flyer. When did he have time? Prima also called out to him, and the Valfleur turned to the goblin and said, Such dirty tricks as this, who look for weak prey, turn into miserable dust before going to hell. After these words, the Valfleur used hellfire, which burned the monster, turning it into dust. A small hole appeared in the ground, from which streams of smoke emerged. Prima came closer and heartily thanked the flyer. Is he not injured? The Valfleur answered, that won't do, which surprised the princess and made her ask, what? What he meant was that he had been messing around with goblins for too long. He needs to learn to focus better. If the teacher had seen him now, he would have beaten him long ago. He imagined the man slapping the Valfleur on the back of the head and screaming, too slow. He turned to the girls and said, next time he will have to do it in about four seconds, or better yet, even faster. Prima folded her hands in front of herself and voiced her thought, it seems that success does not suit him. Aesir closed her eyes and whispered, yeah, this kid is on his own. Then Prima turned to the knight and exclaimed, Aesir also fought well, is she okay? These words made the knight confused for a second, and Prima continued, her words were so bold. Aisha replied, Princess, of course. She belongs to her body and soul, and no flyer can hold a candle to her. Prima smiled and said, This time she will close her eyes to her vile speeches, but next time she will get an Aisha from her. The Valfleur attracted attention and said, He made another sign, it's time to get out of here. After some time spent searching for a way out, they stopped. Aisha said she couldn't believe that they so easily came out of the forest in which they had gotten so lost. The Valfleur agreed, and the princess exclaimed, Let them look. There is a settlement there. They should go there. Valfleur thought it was the first time he had truly left his home village. He can't wait to finally see the world beyond. Then all three continued on their way, while an unfamiliar girl stood behind them, hidden in the shadows of the trees. After some time, someone exclaimed, But why? If the issue is money, then they will pay, he said it. A man with a dissatisfied face will answer, Let them leave in an amicable way. He doesn't need trouble, one look is enough to understand that they are a walking problem. A girl in a frilly dress and a pumped up woman with a huge bag. These words angered Aesir, embarrassed Prim and made Valfleer surprised. The man continued to speak, they are probably accompanying this girl, who is most likely the princess of some country, right? Aesir said with a sweet smile, what a ridiculous assumption. The man completely misunderstood, then her expression changed, after which she exclaimed furiously, there is no way a princess can be a princess. Prima tried to stop her by calling out to her and saying, just a second. The man remained adamant, a straightforward knight who doesn't know how to lie then. This made Aesir curse. Then the Valfleur came up to the table and said with a smile, man, let him at least give them something to eat, they don't ask for anything else. The stranger took the newspaper and replied, he can use it to wrap something with him, but no more. No one will let such suspicious types like them spend the night at their place. There is no peace in their area, so let them be careful. Soon, standing at the tavern, the Valfleur said, well, in the end, they will have to spend the night on the street. And all because someone named Aesir doesn't know how to keep his mouth shut. She made a complete fool of herself. Aesir ordered him to shut up, and then with the most tender face, she turned to the princess and said, she has no forgiveness. Prima smiled sweetly and replied, Everything is fine. They'll try next time. Prima couldn't finish as she began to lose consciousness and fall, which made Aesir loudly exclaim, Princess, Princess. Fortunately, Aesir managed to catch Prim, saving her from falling and hitting the hard ground. Someone's voice came from behind, they won't last long at this rate. Do they have somewhere to stay? The Valfleur turned around and noticed an old woman who was the size of a child. The elderly lady said they could stay with her. Goblins and orcs often hang around these parts. The Valfleur joyfully leaned closer to her and asked, Is it true? The old woman answered, of course, only she has a store, not a hotel. So let them not count on much. The Valfleur straightened up and exclaimed joyfully, There are still good people left in this world. Everything is fine. Aesir was already carrying the princess on her back and answered, Yes, fortunately. It was already night outside. The old woman said, Here is their room. If they need a change of clothes, then let them contact her. She straightened the blanket that covered the sleeping princess. 
The Valfleur looked around the space and rejoiced. Great, this is an ordinary room. Aesher also examined the situation, reacting less emotionally to it. Then the Valfleur went up to one of the walls and exclaimed, Let the knight look at what cool decorations are hanging here. Aesher said with satisfaction, Here the princess will finally be able to rest properly. How much should they pay? The old woman was already leaving the room, answering, Not at all. Let them consider this a whim from a compassionate old woman. They should accept the kindness of others while they can. Let them not worry about little things and have a good rest. Her words surprised the guests very much. A few seconds later, the Valfleur exclaimed, What a generous old woman. Lucky. Aesher looked at him and also said, Since she herself said not to pay then. The knight could not finish, as the princess woke up and screamed loudly, She forbids it. She categorically disagrees with such ingratitude. The Valfleur said in surprise, She woke up. Aesher came closer to her and said, But princess, they have already spent a lot of money during the trip. Prima continued to insist on her opinion, This is impossible. They should thank this kind-hearted old woman. Then the Valfleur began to rummage through other people's things and exclaimed, Exactly. They probably have something in their bag that they can give to her. Aesher immediately became angry at this behavior and ordered him not to touch. Right there. Instead, the Valfleur said, This is sacred armor. Aesher screamed loudly, dissatisfied with the fact that the Valfleur even reached into their bag. Prima said, Sacred silver armor. She ordered not to take anything extra when escaping. The Valfleur put his hands on his sides and understood, but he kept thinking why the bag was so huge. Aesher grabbed the precious things and exclaimed, she won't allow it. The princess herself gave her this armor. This is her beauty. Prima screamed displeasedly enough. They need to get to the Blue Sapphire Kingdom as soon as possible. Valfleur asked again, Blue Sapphire. What else is this? The princess, still sitting on the bed, revealed the map and answered, this is the final goal of their journey. The Blue Sapphire Kingdom is an island nation located in the west. It is surrounded by the sea and has the strongest fleet, a real impregnable fortress. If they finally get there, they can no longer be pursued. The Valfleur asked in surprise the sea. He wondered what this sea was like. After leaving the village, he only hears about things unfamiliar to him. Aesher said that first they should change their clothes. Prima agreed, for sure. They stand out too much. The Valfleur continued to think, but the further they go, the more new things he can see. Wow, he can't wait anymore. Prima began to get out of bed with the words then, go ahead and get new clothes. The Valfleur stopped her, asking her to wait. He can go alone. They're both wildly tired, aren't they? Prima tried to argue, but then the Valfleur asked her not to worry, she could rely on him. The princess sincerely thanked him, and Aesher exclaimed, no one says that she is tired. But after a couple of seconds, the Valfleur left the room and said he had left. Aesha frowned with displeasure and asked herself, does he ever get tired? The Valfleur was already walking along the corridor and thought, I wonder what it's like outside. I'll have to watch everything around again. He remembered something that made him exclaim, yes, exactly. The Valfleur looked back into the room and asked what size clothes they were wearing. However, the girls were both already asleep. The princess was lying in the middle of the bed, hugging a pillow, and Aesher was sitting on the floor, leaning her head against the bed. Valfleur scratched his head and couldn't believe it. Had they already fallen asleep? Oh no, he forgot to ask earlier, so what now? The Valfleur was picked up by the knight, who muttered in her sleep, No, princess, they can't. He decided there was nothing to be done. Then he began to measure their bodies with a tape to understand what size clothes were needed. Soon both girls were lying on the bed, and the Valfleur said that since they said that they were in a hurry, he would take their measurements himself. The old woman, meanwhile, held the tip of the weapon in her hands and examined it carefully. A few seconds later, she put the thing away and said, So many years have passed, but the habits are still the same. Suddenly she heard some steps behind her and turned towards the source of the sound. It was a Valfleur coming down who said, Old woman. She asked if they were still awake. Where is he going with such a bag? The Valfleur pointed his fingers towards the exit and answered casually, he is going to buy clothes for the girls. Then the old woman asked, in the middle of the night, all shops are closed. At that moment, the Valfleur came to his senses, for real. Well, he tried so hard. The old woman asked in surprise, he doesn't know such obvious things, looks like a traveler. If cheap clothes fit them, he can go into the closet and get what they need. Valfleur asked joyfully, really, thank you. In the closet, there was a long hanger with a huge amount of clothes on it. After some time, the Valfleur put the armor on the table and said, This is for the old woman. 
She was surprised by what she saw, and he continued to say, This is as a thank you for the fact that she decided to stay with them. The old woman replied, She told me she doesn't need anything. The Val Fleur interrupted her speech and exclaimed, Well, no, madam. She said earlier that we should accept the kindness of others while we can, right? The Val Fleur smiled proudly, and the old woman straightened her glasses on her face and answered, Okay. Then she will look at what he brought. The Val Fleur handed her the thing and leaned on the table. After some time, the old woman said that this could not be bought anywhere, which surprised the Val Fleur. She continued, This is mithril sacred armor, and it is also of quite high quality. If you buy this, then even 20 platinum coins will not be enough. Val Fleur mentally asked, Platinum coins? The old woman said, this is too good, she cannot afford to accept it, but she is glad that they want to thank her so much. The Val Fleur took the thing back and said annoyedly, well that's it. Suddenly a thought came to him, what if this is not so good? The old woman asked in surprise, what? She looked at the way the Val Fleur threw the armor up and wondered what he was planning. At that second, the Val Fleur himself jumped up and began to hit the armor from all sides, because of which small pieces flew off from Edo and left dents. The old woman was shocked by what was happening. The Valfleur then picked up the armor, already significantly different from what it was just a minute ago, and asked, what about this? Now it has a big defect, so it's cheaper, right? The old woman frowned and exclaimed, is he stupid? The Valfleur calmly answered, it was his own fault for bringing such an expensive thing, so nothing could be done. Suddenly the old woman first smiled and then began to laugh loudly, he is such a funny guy. Okay, he persuaded her. Since the armor is defective, she will take it for 100 gold. At first, the Valfleur was happy, hooray. Then he thought about it and asked, what are gold ones? Instead of answering the question, the old woman said that she would also pick up the things they needed for the trip, equal in value to their charity. Valfleur exclaimed, wow, thank you. Sometime later, when the sun was already shining brightly in the sky, Prima thanked the old woman for everything she had done for them. The elderly lady replied, it's nothing. Aesher looked at the huge bag that the Valfleur was about to take and said, It feels like they have even more things than they had before. Then the old woman looked at the Valfleur and said, By the way, he has good taste in choosing clothes. The Valfleur exclaimed otherwise. The princess took the hem of her dress and exclaimed, The flyer is simply a miracle. The dress size is perfect. Aesher also stood in new clothes, she said less emotionally. Well, yes, not bad. At least you can send him shopping. The Valfleur happily said, Great. Good thing he took their measurements last night. Prima asked in shock, Flyer, what other measurements? He answered slightly embarrassed, well, those are for clothing sizes. They both fell asleep, so he decided to undress them and carefully measure everything. True, it was not easy with chest girth. The girls imagined this scene a little differently from what it really was, which is why one of them was now in shock, and the other swung her sword and ran forward. Prima said she thinks the Flyer has already talked enough. A fight began in which Aesher beat the Valfleur, and the old woman simply stood nearby. Suddenly a man came up and called out to her. The old lady turned around and asked the owner of the inn, what did he want? The man said he sees that she sheltered these guys for the night. She also gave them her precious trophies. The old woman answered dryly, something like that. The innkeeper crossed his arms over his chest and continued, she was finally able to live a peaceful life, but she never let anyone get so close to her. Has the heart of the former strongest assassin girl softened? The old woman exhaled and answered, No matter what, she just liked this guy. She can't help it, he's so good. Aesher at this time continued to scream furiously, He is a pervert. After some time, walking along the road between the trees, the Valfleur said annoyedly, He agrees, he screwed up, but it doesn't happen to anyone. The princess turned away and exclaimed, She hates him. Aesher supported, she will cut him. The Valfleur was indignant. Are they so angry simply because he saw them naked? As if he had never seen naked girls in his life. He doesn't understand what's on women's minds. He was looking forward to this trip so much, and then what happened? Doesn't matter. He held a leaf in his hands, which he then threw to the ground and stomped loudly, using the shackles of suffering. The girls turned around, Aesher asked what? Is this also some kind of magic? Hesitatingly, the Valfleur answered, yes, yes, and he himself thought, fortunately, they fell for it. He reported these are the basics from his teacher. It's called magic training. However, recently he completely forgot about it. The spell materializes magical weights on the legs and arms, thus training the muscles. Prima asked, will Aesher try? It's fun. 
The knight grinned and replied, Well, okay, since the Valfleur can do it, then she can handle it. The Valfleur squatted down and brought another sheet of paper with the words to someone else's leg, so he will start from the legs. The next second Aesir fell, hitting her knees on the ground. Valfleur exclaimed, What? It shouldn't be too hard. Prima asked if the knight was okay. Aesir gritted her teeth tightly and asked what? The human body is not capable of lifting such weight. Do you need this thing for both hands and feet? The Valfleur laughed awkwardly and asked for forgiveness twice, when suddenly the princess called out to him loudly. She said, This is amazing. Magic can do so many things, it's crazy. The Valfleur answered, slightly confused, yes. Then Prima said, she wants to try it too. At that same second, Aesir shouted, No way, she's a princess. Valfleur stood a little aside and rejoiced. Have they really stopped blaming him for everything? After a while, Aesir turned around and asked the Valfleur, by the way, there is nothing in this magic of his, what can you ride on? Summon a carriage, for example. The Valfleur thought about it and answered, it seems there is no such thing. Aesir put her palm to her face and came to the conclusion that it was dangerous for them to continue their journey to the kingdom of Blue Sapphire at the same speed. They will need to get horses from the nearest town. It is quite expected that someone else will soon be sent in pursuit of them. Prima sadly agreed, but the Valfleur did not give his consent. He said he wanted to continue traveling at the same pace. If someone comes for them, they will somehow cope with Aesir, right? The knight replied, if the enemy is small fry, then yes, but if the Church of the Holy Angels is sent after them, they are unlikely to cope alone. The Valfleur asked in surprise angels. Then the Prima exclaimed, no, they won't go that far. Aesir said calmly, they must be prepared for anything. Since they are talking about the princess's relatives, they will do anything to get rid of her. A Valfleur intervened in the conversation. He asked them to wait and asked what kind of church this was. The Church of the Holy Angels is a neutral organization. It watches over the seven kingdoms of this world. The church stands above people, but sometimes, if the angels want, they help people. Prima said, if the angels agree to the request of her sisters and come after their souls. She fell silent, unable to finish, and the Valfler thought, that means angels. In his era, were there such creatures at all? I wonder what they are like. Then he smiled and exclaimed, it looks like something interesting is coming up. He would love to meet these angels, Aesir exclaimed sharply, no way. This surprised the Valfleur and he began to listen further, you cannot fight with angels under any circumstances. He understood, if they come to them, all they can do is run. Angels have incredible power. No matter how confident the Valfleur is in his own strength, it can hardly compare with the strength of the angels because they are the natural enemies of shamans. 1,000 years ago, his village was destroyed and all the shamans were exterminated by these angels. Valfleur was absolutely shocked by this information, and Aesir continued to say that the very existence of Valfleur made this absurd story closer to reality. After all, no one can be against them. The Valfleur was indignant, is this some kind of joke? He took it for granted that shamans simply disappeared over time. But extermination? So there was a teacher too. The princess clapped her hands, which prevented the Valfleur from finishing her thought. She exclaimed, they should close this topic. It is not a fact that they will oppose the church. Moreover, according to rumors, angels very rarely agree to fulfill someone's requests. And since this is unlikely, you shouldn't worry about something that didn't even happen. Aesir suddenly softened and agreed, and that's true. They are better off focusing on what they can do now. As expected from a princess, her insight makes her even cuter. Prima turned away and asked, maybe it's time to have a snack. She was hungry. Meanwhile, in the cathedral of the Church of the Holy Angels, a small creature was flying, dropping various letters and papers from a basket. This is what Mr. Zuriel exclaimed. Mr. Zuriel. The angel turned to the little creature and said, everything is falling. There is no point in littering the cathedral. It answered, it even today brought written petitions from the lower race. People waste so much paper. Mr. Zuriel praised the little angel and took out one piece of paper from the mountain of all the others. He looked closely and said, this is a request to kill the seventh princess of the White Pearl Kingdom. It was decided that they would entrust this matter to that very person. After some time, the action took place somewhere in the Kingdom of the White Pearl, namely near the tract. The unknown person said that he heard that this kingdom is quite prosperous, but something is painfully quiet here. The long-haired passerby replied, Yes, it looks like the problem of inheriting the throne is in full swing here. Dangerous things are happening, how scary. 
Then one of the men stamped his foot and shouted, He, stand. If he wants to move on, then let him give his money. Now is not the time for tourism in their country, Kalabak. The second man with dark hair supported his comrade and mockingly asked the passerby, Will he now say that he didn't know? Because of the struggle for the throne, order in the country is getting worse and worse every day. The short, fair-haired guy began to cry when he was ordered to lay out everything he had on him, otherwise he would die. He stuttered a little and muttered how he could say something so that he wouldn't be underestimated by freaks like them. The two men said at the same time what? A passerby began to blow his nose and exclaimed, What a pity. Little people are still inferior creatures after all, which is why he has no choice but to train and control them. One of the men got angry at what he heard and exclaimed, He, what did he say there? Stop talking incomprehensible nonsense. Then the short passer by grinned maliciously. At the same time, the group of flyers was eating. Prima took a bite of the snake, strung on a sharp stick, and exclaimed how delicious it was. Then Aisher noticed this and said worriedly, Princess, you can't eat on the go. She turned to her and asked her to stop. Does Aisher want a piece? The knight just put her palm out in front of her in a negative gesture and turned her head to the side. The Valfleur smiled and noticed at this time, and the princess okay so got hooked on food during the hike, he was happy. Prima exclaimed, she is also happy, but for him. The Valfleur looked somehow drooping before this, so she was worried. He replied, everything is fine, don't let her worry. He was a little shocked at first, but after some good thinking, he realized that there was nothing he could do about what happened so long ago. Yes, nothing can be changed, but this unsettled him. He doesn't hold a grudge against the angels, he doesn't think they defeated the teacher. Aisher, walking ahead of everyone, turned to the others and exclaimed, they have come. The Valfleur continued to think, after all, he vowed not to limit himself to anything and enjoy life. A huge city spread out before them. It would be better for a Valfleur to have fun than to indulge in despondency. He wants to live a second life for himself. And now he looked at the large number of buildings below and exclaimed, how huge it is. On one of the streets of that same city, a man who had just recently tried to take money from a stranger crawled back in horror. He was covered in blood, as was the space in front of him. The man exclaimed in a trembling voice, they apologized, they were wrong, he begs for forgiveness. The long-haired passerby asked, forgive me? What is the man talking about? No, no, he is just fulfilling his duties for the sake of selecting people. He cleanses the population of undersized individuals, so to speak. The man cried, pressing himself harder into the wall behind him. Then the passerby opened his wings behind him and continued to say, what is more important, can a man resist at least a little? When an angel is in this form, he really gives his all to his work. If his duties go smoothly, then he does not experience proper pleasure. That is why he asks the man very much. At that second, the bully stood up and ran with a loud scream to the side. The angel pretended to wipe away his tears and said, again, he is on his own. What a pity. This is a complete disappointment. He made just one gesture with his free hand when suddenly the man's body was torn into two parts. Then the angel went in the opposite direction and continued to say, lately everything has been the same. Is there really no more worthy job to do? Exactly. The angel completely forgot. He received a new assignment from Mr. Zuriel. The Cathedral Church of the Holy Angels stands at the center of the world and oversees the seven great kingdoms. And sometimes the cathedral responds to people's requests, however, due to the fact that angels are higher than the human species, all seven kingdoms, without exception, must be extremely careful. The long-haired angel looked at the piece of paper and said, well, he hopes the next target will not be such a weakling. Kingdoms must be careful because compared to people, angels are higher beings. One of them was already at the 12th rank and his name was Mori. He wiped someone else's blood from his face and said that soon he would meet the seventh princess named Primavera. After some time, the Valfleur slowly walked along the sidewalk and looked around with delight. There were a huge number of beautiful buildings nearby, which made him say in a drawn out manner, wow, so what does a city mean? Prima folded her hands in front of her and asked with a sweet smile, how's the flyer here? He couldn't stop shaking his head in different directions, trying to look at every new detail. He said, it's crazy, he's all excited. So, there is such a world. Aisher continued to remain collected. She asked Valfleur not to fuss. First, they need to find a place to stay. They walked on, and Prima exclaimed how she wanted to finally take a shower. Aisher said, she will rub her back. At that moment, the Valfleur accidentally touched one of the passers-by, which angered the stranger. 
but he immediately asked for forgiveness. Prima responded to the knight's intentions and said, let her not even dream. Aesir exclaimed, she is completely without second thoughts. Because of the huge bag on his back, filled with a large number of various substances, it was difficult for the Valfleur to move through the crowd of people. Gradually, he began to move away from the girls and asked them to stop. However, because of the argument, they did not hear him. Aesir said she would be so happy if she could touch the beautiful skin of the princess. Prima whined painfully, well, how much can you do? The Valfleur was moving away from them more and more. He extended his hand up to attract attention and asked them to wait. Then Prima turned around and exclaimed, flyer, let him save her. Aesir is at it again. Prima was unable to finish as she noticed the absence of her comrade, which puzzled her. After a while, the Valfleur cursed and wondered, how big is this city? He also lost girls. He continued to walk along unfamiliar streets, not yet knowing what to do next. Valfleur felt his stomach growling and said he was going to starve. Suddenly, he felt a pleasant aroma and exclaimed, why does this smell so delicious? Where? Then he noticed in front of him a cute girl in a headscarf who greeted him, welcome to the bakery of happiness. The Valfleur came closer and said, she smells so good here, he wants to try it. The unfamiliar girl smiled shyly and exclaimed, she was pleased to hear. Does he want to try her nut buns? Valfleur asked, nut buns. Very soon he took a bite of the pastry, which was so delicious that it made him wonder what it was. Simply delicious. The girl covered it with her hand and happily asked again, right? Wallflyer instantly replied, yes. Walnuts are so fragrant and have a fun crunch in your mouth. He thought it was amazing. They also had buns in the village, but this is a completely different level. The girl smiled joyfully and sincerely thanked him. She was unable to sell a single item, which made her think she would have to return to the store. The Valfleur asked again in surprise, not a single one. He thought, this is strange, but the buns are delicious. Suddenly a voice was heard nearby, has little Bella come again? There were three men next to the Valfleur. The shortest one was the main one, he sat down on the table with pastries. Next to him was a huge stranger of large size, and a little further away stood a tall, thin man. The first of them asked, will Bella have fun with them today? She stepped away from the table in fear and exclaimed, here they are again. When will they calm down? They constantly come only to disturb her. The short man touched her body and said, well, that's nice. Let her agree once. Bella did not tolerate being touched and hit the man on the cheek, exclaiming he became insolent. Then the largest of the strangers turned the table over, causing all the rolls to fly apart. How dare she raise her hand against his comrade? The short man grinned, looking at Bella who was lying on the ground, and said, she doesn't even have clients, why is she even trying to sell anything else? The thin man turned over the last basket of baked goods and said, they will teach her something more interesting. After this, she won't even want to sell bread anymore. Valfleur, I watched all this from the side and thought, clearly, it's all because of them. Bella, meanwhile, began to collect baked goods in the basket and answered, how many times have they already done this? It's all to no avail, she'll still bake more bread and come back to sell it again. The Valfleur wondered in surprise what? Bella began to cry and wipe away her tears, exclaiming, she promised, their behavior won't stop her. One of the men exclaimed, stubborn girl, let her give up already. Then the Valfleur approached Bella and also began to collect baked goods in the basket, saying that he would help her. The most important of the hooligans exclaimed, has he gone completely crazy? The Valfleur didn't even turn around and answered, he's already tired of them, have they even tried her buns? The man asked, what? Right now, he won't even try such garbage. Then the Valfleur ordered them to stop insulting Belle. The bread she bakes is very tasty and it's definitely not garbage. To confirm his words, the Valfleur took one of the buns and took a bite of it, which made the hooligans wince in disgust. They exclaimed, come on. He eats bread raised from the ground, it's all covered in sand. Even Bella was surprised. However, the Valfleur continued to chew the pastry, feeling the creak of sand and earth under his teeth. He exclaimed, yes, delicious. Bella wondered if he was okay. She then thanked him, he had gone so far for her. Even if the Valfleur praises her bread purely out of pity, the Valfleur did not let her finish and asked again, is it a pity? There is no pity here, he really liked the truth, don't let her worry. He wants to try all the bread she bakes. His name is Valfleur, what's her name? She answered shyly, Bella. The thin man leaned towards the short one and said, comrade, there is just some kind of too romantic atmosphere between them. He's not joking. Then the main bully shouted, let Debu and Harry smash this insolent one. They answered in unison, yes. Suddenly the voice of Aesir, who was standing behind the men, was heard. 
she said furiously, gentlemen, let them get away from here as far as possible. The short man turned around and exclaimed irritably, one after another they got out. He's already been pissed off here, does she even know where to go? He could not finish, because at that second Aesher hit him with his fist right in the jaw with all his might. She screamed, she said to get out of here, you miserable piece of trash. Very soon all three hooligans were beaten and thrown aside. Bella was happy about what was happening, and the Valfleur exclaimed, Aesher, and Prima too. At that moment, the princess turned to the knight and asked her not to be too angry. After a little time, the Valfleur closed his eyes and smiled with relief. Aesher crossed her arms under her chest with displeasure, called out to him and asked what his role was. She asked him to talk to her. The Valfleur replied, he is Prim's guard. Then the knight got angry, and at the same time he abandoned the princess and went to have fun. Let him have a conscience. The Valfleur sat on his knee, bowing his head down, on which a lump had formed. People passing by watched with interest the unfolding scene. Prima exclaimed, Aesher, let her stop. Bella at this time leaned her hands to her chest and could not believe that the princess was standing next to her. Then she began to try to justify the Valfleur and exclaimed, Everything is wrong. It's all her fault. Fleer was just saving her from those hooligans. Valfleur sincerely asked Prim for forgiveness, and she replied, Everything is fine. Nothing happened. Next time, just let him be more careful. Suddenly an incomprehensible sound was heard, which caused silence for some time, which was interrupted by Aesher screaming, He is unbearable. How dare he interrupt such a noble speech of the princess with such shameful sounds. She grabbed the Valfleur by the collar, and he tried to justify himself, in fact, it wasn't in. Prima at that moment raised one hand up, drawing attention to herself, and with the other she held onto the hem of her dress, squeezing it tightly. Being completely embarrassed and flushed with shame, she asked how shameful the sound was. Aesher turned around and answered, No way, it's a very pleasant sound. Bella exclaimed, she asks for forgiveness. If they don't mind, they can come to her store. She would like to thank them and apologize. The Valfleur looked at her, and Aesher at that moment turned to Prima and asked her to be patient a little. Now they will find food. She laughed awkwardly until the princess seriously asked her to die. After some time, they came to a bakery with a positive name. Bella exclaimed, Welcome to Happiness Bakery. Let them pass. At that moment, an elderly lady came out of the building, clutching a paper bag with fresh loaves. She exclaimed with a smile, She will definitely come here again. Another girl standing next to her child happily remarked, Wow, it's Bella. The Valfleur was surprised by what he saw. He exclaimed, Wow, how many people are there? Aisha agreed, The bakery is thriving. Then the woman in the headscarf greeted Belle. Welcome back. The man with the short mustache also asked Belle, Has she sold all her bread? She smiled joyfully and exclaimed, Uncle, aunt, well, things are going slowly. The Valfleur standing behind her greeted them with a smile. His uncle and aunt looked at him in shock. Their emotions were different. She was surprised and he was angry. The woman exclaimed, Let her beloved husband look. Belle has a new boyfriend. The man shouted what? He knew it. Here he is now. Out of anger, the uncle did not finish, and then Bella asked in surprise what? All wrong, this is a client. The uncle had already run forward, swinging a rolling pin and shouting, How dare a Valfleur encroach on his child, whom he raised with his own hands. Bella blocked the man's path and asked her uncle to calm down. The rest of the customers, standing nearby with pastries in their hands, said that Bell finally has someone. Uncle heard this and screamed, and they went there too. If the Valfleur really loves Bella, then he should immediately list more than 10 reasons why he likes her. Bella kept trying to calm him down and screamed, Uncle. The man exclaimed, he can easily say a hundred reasons right now. Bella once again asked him to stop. The Valfleur at that moment leaned over to Aesher and asked if she thought this man looked like her. The knight crossed her arms over her chest and asked what he was talking about. They are never alike. Then the aunt awkwardly covered her mouth with her hand and asked for forgiveness for this. She also rushed to conclusions they can try their baked goods. Then the travelers sincerely exclaimed, thank you very much. In front of them was a basket with aromatic food. There were croissants as well as beautiful rolls. Prima has already taken a bite of one of these, wishing the others bon appetit. Aisha also started eating. She looked at the pastries and said how delicious it was. What a rich taste. Valfleur, despite the fact that he had only recently eaten baked goods, he began to eat again. He replied, that's it. Belle's bread is just as good. She laughed awkwardly and exclaimed, she's still just learning. Uncle, meanwhile, sighed heavily, stretching his shoulder. 
Ant turned around and asked, What is it? The man replied, Old age is not a joy. Lately age has been making itself felt. Then one of the customers at the checkout exclaimed, Let uncle take care of himself. Another man agreed that if he drove himself to the grave, they would not be able to eat delicious bread. The third customer exclaimed, The bakery of happiness is the treasure of their city. Uncle smiled joyfully and replied, They are so kind. In this case, he cannot become limp. Valfleer observed all this from the side and voiced his thoughts out loud, and everyone loves this guy here. Bella replied that people really love the bread he bakes. She too, someday wants to bake bread that will make people happy, like her uncle's bread. In her dreams, she stood near the table and embarrassedly asked forgiveness for such a simple meal. And in response, they told her that it was very tasty. Thanks for the treat, Bella said. This is her dream, and she also wants to repay them for their work. Valfleur asked, should I repay? Bella plunged into memories and hastened to explain her words. She was abandoned when she was still a baby. Then the little child lay in a pile of garbage and cried. Her uncle and aunt took her in. They surrounded Bella with love and raised her as their own daughter. She always wanted to repay them for their love. Even as a very young child, Bella learned to roll out dough with a rolling pin, wanting to become like her uncle and aunt. Valfleur said, now it's clear, so that's why she decided to become a baker. Bella tilted her head to the side in embarrassment and said, she always liked baking bread, but she wasn't very good at it. The Valfleur replied, no, he understands her. Bella turned to him and asked what? Now it was Valfleur's turn to delve into his memories, where he stood next to his teacher and trained. He said a person can't choose his dream, and he and Bella are the lucky ones. Bella called out to him and wanted to say something, but the Valfleur interrupted her speech and asked Belle to let him help her dream. Then he called his uncle, let him let the Valfleur help. This is in gratitude for the delicious bread. Prima looked at her comrade, giggled and said, this is in the spirit of a flyer. Aesher brought the cup of drink to her face and agreed seriously, he is such a problematic guy. After some time, the working day was over, and then my uncle exclaimed, Great, Bella, time to bring up the board. She replied, I got it. Bella went outside, carrying out the assignment she had received, and thought, today was such a good day. The flyer gave her confidence in her abilities. Starting tomorrow, she will try even harder to learn to sing bread. Suddenly, she noticed something lying on the sidewalk that caught her attention. Bella asked in surprise, a feather? Where did this come from? Then she raised her head higher to find the answer to her question. An angel hovered in the air, covering his mouth with a handkerchief. Maury said, so this is where the target is. What kind of stench? The gathering places of people smell like a pigsty. The angel looked down and said, he will begin his search from here. His gaze was focused on the bakery of happiness, next to which Bella was now standing. Maury said, it's a little burdensome. It's easier to just destroy this pasture. Meanwhile, the Valfler sensed something was wrong. He stood among other people who were having fun and discussing various things among themselves. Valfleur couldn't calm down. What kind of feeling is this? Something terrible is coming. Bella took a step forward, continuing to peer into the sky, and whispered, What is this? She couldn't clearly see the angel hovering above her, but she definitely saw his long wings, from which the feathers continued to fall. Maury said it will start with this block. It would be nice if the target ended up here. The angel with a crazy smile extended his hand forward, pointing his finger to a certain place. Then the Valfleur exclaimed, Aesher, let her protect Prim. He will take care of everyone else. The girls looked at their comrade in disbelief, not yet realizing everything that was happening. Bella, meanwhile, looked up with her mouth open in surprise. Suddenly, the angel began to attack, using his power to destroy part of the city. Bricks and boards, broken off from the destroyed buildings, flew in different directions. People got scared, screamed, and tried to save their lives by running in different directions. They asked, what happened? But no one knew, something flashed in the sky and then. Suddenly, there was a cry for help. Mother. Bella looked around in fear, and the Valfler looked at the others and asked, are they okay? Aesher looked at Prim with concern and asked if the princess was hurt. She answered hesitantly, yes. One of the passers-by asked in surprise, what is that there? This shop. He didn't finish speaking because the Valfler exclaimed, are the guys okay? What was it now? Prima and Aesher looked at the sky in shock, finding it hard to believe what was happening. The princess trembled and said, no, how can that be? They really came for her. The Valfleur suddenly froze and opened his eyes, hearing the voice of an angel behind him who said, this is where Primavera is. Mori thought about destroying about 10 more blocks, 
but it's always better when there is an opportunity to save energy. Aesir got angry hearing this and hugged the princess even closer to her. Mori, meanwhile, continued to float in the air and with a smile said, he is a 12th rank angel from the Church of Holy Angels, his name is Mori. He came to eliminate the target at the request of the White Pearl Kingdom. The Valfleur kept looking at him and thought, Angel, so that's who. Then he opened his eyes in fear and mentally exclaimed, No, Bella. All the while, my aunt was frightened and asking her husband to hold on. Someone, let someone call a doctor soon. One of the passers-by lay next to the bloody body and screamed, the uncle had a piece of wood in his stomach. If the bleeding is not immediately restored then, the man couldn't finish because he didn't want to say it out loud. Aunt cried and screamed, no, her favorite. Bella was also nearby, holding her uncle's hand and asking him not to die. The man lay on top of the remaining debris while a broken piece of wood protruded from the middle of his stomach. All his clothes were covered in blood, as was his face. Bella was sobbing, not stopping screaming, uncle. Aesir continued to hug the princess to her and mentally swear she screwed up. She was constantly on the alert. In such a situation, they wouldn't even be able to escape. Since it has come to this, there is nothing left to do but sacrifice himself for the opportunity to kill the angel. Mori noticed with what a fierce look the knight was looking at him and asked what? Is she going to fight? Well done. Then the angel smiled and said, it will be much more pleasant to do the job. These words made Aesir even more scared. She thought, this is pressure. Is she stupid? There is a whole abyss between the powers of man and angel. Badly. At this rate, they will all be there. Aesir could not finish because suddenly a Valfler stood in front of her and called out to her. He asked, that turkey in the sky is the enemy, right? Mori rubbed his chin and was surprised, who else is this? Strange, nothing was said about him in the task. Aesir turned the princess in the other direction so that she could not see what was happening and screamed, flyer. No, she said it. People can't even scratch angels. Angels are on a completely different level. Therefore, Aesir's speech was suddenly interrupted because Mori said, for a lower animal, the Valfleur is too impudent, the pig grunts well. Let him know his place, hug. The angel swung his hand and then threw his magical spear forward, starting to attack. Aesir watched all this and thought, what a terrible thirst for murder. It feels like the blood is about to boil in your body. And then she suddenly realized, but this thirst for killing does not come from an angel. The Valfleur raised his fist, repelling the enemy's attack. He said he doesn't care who it is or who is stronger than who. The Valfleur was completely enveloped in fire. He was in complete rage. Before his eyes, there was still a picture of a crying Bella who was hugging her uncle. Then the Valfleur exclaimed in all seriousness, the angel will pay for everything and will burn in hellfire. Meanwhile, in the kingdom of the White Pearl, otherwise known as the land of precious stones. This is a prosperous state whose main industries are mining and processing of precious stones. However, the current ruler of this kingdom was bedridden due to illness. At that moment, there was a loud scream, father. Within the walls of the palace, there was an ugly struggle between the heirs for the throne. The young guy held the dying man's hand and shouted, Mackenzie is here. Father, the man standing next to him said, gentlemen and princesses, the king needs as much peace as possible. Suddenly, the blonde girl ordered him to shut his mouth. He's actually a stranger here, so let him get out of here. The first prince, named Mackenzie, cried with sadness and asked his father to sleep peacefully. He will take care of all government affairs. The second prince, whose name was Grender, calmly said, It's too early for such speeches, brother. Then he sat down, took the king's hand and said, as he thought, his brother would only add to the worries. The father can entrust all matters to him. Mackenzie suddenly became angry and exclaimed, what? Meanwhile, the first princess named Finney straightened a strand of hair near her face and asked from whom she hears about the experiences. From a brother who pretty much ruined things with their mining industry. The second princess, Mana, exclaimed, the princes cause too many problems and the people don't trust them. The third prince, whose name was Winda, said, father, let him rely on it. The third princess, Monteria, interrupted her brother and said, no, it's better to trust her. The trembling king ordered them to stop. At such a time, brothers, after a few seconds he asked where Prima was. This question made all the other heirs angry. The king said he wanted to see her, but they answered him, father, Prima is now away on business. The first princess got very angry. She left the room, mentally swearing, damn Prima. I swore. They are constantly under my father's nose, and he is always talking about her and about her. Did the Prima really plan everything? How cunning. Suddenly a servant appeared next to her and said, Mrs. Thinney, 
He reported that the Church of the Holy Angels accepted their request, so a 12th rank angel had already been sent for Lady Prima. This news instantly made the first princess happy, who began to dance and exclaimed, Great! She knew that giving them a large sum of money would be the right decision. Then the servant asked, however, is it too much to send an angel for Madame Prima? She's alone. Finney turned around and cursed, you idiot. For everything to go smoothly, there is no other choice. Very soon, she won't have to worry about Prima anymore. She will be smeared on the wall. Meanwhile, the princess exclaimed, Flyer! He calmly turned to the girls and ordered them to take refuge with the others in a safe place. He would deal with this rooster. He was seriously angry, looking at his opponent with a furious gaze. Mori heard everything and sighed, did they call him a rooster? Suddenly, the Valfler heard someone calling him from behind. It was Bella who said the store was destroyed. The Valfleur whispered her name with regret, hearing her uncle being asked to live. The men tried to help as best they could, but under the circumstances, it was problematic. Bella continued to say, her uncle was badly injured, and she doesn't know what will happen to him. What if he... Bella couldn't finish, as speaking her thoughts out loud was too difficult for her. She began to sob again, wiping endless tears with her palms, and exclaimed, No, she's scared. She will lose everything. Things dear to her are disappearing one after another. What should she do? The Valfleur answered confidently, everything will be fine. He won't let anyone take away anything dear to his heart. Just let Belp stop crying. Aesher stood up with Prima and hurried her, however. The princess turned to Bella and asked her to believe in Valfleur. If she dies here, she will definitely lose everything. Prima took Bella's hand, who whispered her name, and pulled her in the direction away from danger. What about her uncle? She'll think of something. Everything will work out. Finally, before leaving, she whispered, Bella asks the flyer to stay alive. Angel watched the three girls leaving and said, They are so brave. Do they really think he'll let him escape from under his nose? Meanwhile, the Val flyer jumped into the air, ending up on the same level as Angel, who asked in shock, Fire magic. He thought, The Valfler creates an airflow with the help of heat from the fire and with the same help the air soars. He praised the reception out loud, not bad, not bad. But what a pity. At that second, the Valfleur was attacked from different sides by blinding spears, which took him by surprise. Then Mori asked, how's it going? This is an angelic spear. He took another such weapon in his hands and explained that it is materialized light that continuously changes its shape. This is a power that only angels can possess. Well, did the Valfleur realize? He means the difference between angels and them, that is, cattle. Then Mori noticed that the Valfleur was trying to get out of captivity and said, let him not overpower himself in Twitch if he does not want his body to be torn to pieces. These words did not stop the Valfleur's attempts to get out. Mori wrapped his hands around one angelic spear and continued to speak, so how exactly will he train the impudent pig? Exactly. First, he will take out the eyeballs. Then he looked at his opponent, who still continued to try to somehow get rid of the received attack. The angel was unhappy, he said it was useless. Looks like Valfleur has the same brain as a pig. This semblance of fire magic could not do anything to his spears, no matter how hard he tried. Suddenly, Mori fell silent, surprised at what he just saw. A bright flash formed right in front of him, which blinded and deafened even the three girls who continued to run in search of a safe place. The angel fell to the ground and screamed loudly, clutching his face. It burns. Smoke was coming from his hair, and it turned out to be scorched by fire. Mori couldn't calm down. What? How could a Valfleur? This is an angelic spear. The angel winced in pain and thought, did his opponent just burn a spear made of light? Who is he? Meanwhile, the Valfleur also landed on the ground and said with a satisfied smile, great, it looks like it worked. Now he can calmly knock everything bad out of the angel. The Valfleur burned with fire so intensely that flames even came out of his mouth. The angel with damaged wings was still lying on the ground and cursing damned heat. So this is not just fire magic. And yet, somewhere he had already felt something similar. Suddenly realization came to Mori, and he screamed, it can't be. Is this the flame of the Lord of Hell? His scream was so loud that even Aesher, Prima, and Bella turned around in shock, looking at the Valfleur. Meanwhile, he began to attack the angel, hitting him with his fiery leg. Prima grabbed the hem of her dress and asked Aesher, did she see this? The knight answered yes. She can't believe it. This angel can barely do anything against the Valfleur. Mori was thrown back with just one blow. Due to a recent attack from a Valfleur, the angel's tooth fell out and blood began to flow from her nose and mouth. 
He cursed as he hit the ground again, and then spread his wings. He barely got up from the sidewalk, gathering his remaining strength. Mori said abruptly, yes, so that he would be wounded, and even this unfortunate flame. But from where? This flame should have been destroyed along with the Lord of Hell over 1,000 years ago. Valfleur asked quietly, Lord of Hell? What is he talking about? Mori screamed, O oh Lord. Now he clearly sees with his own eyes why they, angels, were created. This is all so that they pass the test given to them. So that's it. Also that they eliminate the surviving shamans and wipe this cursed flame from the face of the earth. The angel's clothes began to crack and tear, because his muscles suddenly began to swell and become too large. Valfleur looked at the angel in surprise, who exclaimed, He is a twelfth rank angel from the church of holy angels named Mori. His foot also became so huge that just one step was enough to break the tiles on the sidewalk. Mori became many times larger than the Valfleur and said, He will crush this worm. Let the Valfleur not dare to underestimate him, the angel. The shaman, meanwhile, remained in his place and said disinterestedly, The short fat guy has become a huge fat guy, and what has changed? In both cases, he is just a sweaty piece of fat. These words angered Mori even more, causing him to grab the spear again and order the Valfleur to shut her mouth. He began to destroy more and more buildings, forcing people to scatter in different directions. Prima wordly asked Bell not to stop. Aisha ran ahead and directed them to come here quickly. The angel, meanwhile, grabbed two spears in both hands and shouted, Well, shaman, there's nothing he can do to oppose his true strength. The Mori, who had gone mad, sent dozens of spears towards the Valfler, who repelled the received attacks with all his might. The angel said he understands perfectly why the Valfleur is furious. He wants to avenge his relatives from the past, right? These words made Valfleur remember his teacher, whom he loved so much. Mori continued to speak with wild eyes, however, history has already proven that the shaman is no match for the angel. Valfleur will not even be able to dispel their regrets, and... The angel could not finish, as the Valfleur interrupted his speech and exclaimed himself, The strong country of Mori is to hit the target, as he understood. The flames that the Valfleur created burned the angel's hands, causing him to wince in pain. The shaman said he didn't care if he overdid it. There are living people here. He is annoyed by types like him, who calmly take away from them what is dear to them. Shamans were knights who defended the gates of hell, so they were prepared for the outcome that befell them. However, the local townspeople are a completely different matter. They should not die like this. And then the Valfleur mentally asked his teacher, is this true? This is how he would like the Valfleur to live, so that he protects those who are dear to him, here and now. He jumped again, finding himself level with the head of Mori, who exclaimed, freak. However, to the angel's surprise, the Valfleur jumped off his shoulder and flew higher. He turned around and teasingly asked to attack quickly a piece of Sal, or is his angelic butt not keeping up with his speed. Mori formed a ring of his energy and ordered the Valfleur to stop, do not dare to run away. The shaman did not listen, continuing to jump away from the houses and rush forward. His goal was to go beyond the city limits so that there would be no more innocent victims. Soon he stopped turning to face the angel directly. Mori bared his teeth furiously and said, he has driven the shaman into a corner. No one will bother them anymore. Now he can deal with him as his heart pleases. Valfleur agreed, exactly. This is his omission, he never introduced himself. The shaman took off his extra clothes and continued to speak. From this moment, a serious battle begins. One must follow the rules of decency. He is a first class, third class battle shaman, and his name is Valfleur. He got into a fighting position, clenching his fists and grinning slyly, fully prepared for battle. He asked, well, is Mori ready? He came up with something. Then the Valfleur began to mentally pronounce all his actions. He put his thumbs back on both hands, sticking his middle and index fingers forward like the tips of a spear. He then concentrates the flames on the tips of these fingers and directs it towards the fat opponent. Correction, for a huge piece of lard. He'll call it a magical fire missile. Then fireballs flew from his hands, seeing which Mori exclaimed, What is this? The Valfleur calmly answered, Yes. So, an idea just came to him. Let him be forgiven, but he wants to try all sorts of different things on him. The angel ordered the Valfleur to stop teasing him. He is a sucker. Mori used a shield of spears of light, successfully repelling other people's attacks. He exclaimed, Shaman is an idiot. There has not yet been a single attack that could penetrate the shield. He pronounced the last words with difficulty, since his barrier did not work as well as he expected, which is why the angel soon flew away, being shrouded in fire. 
The Valfleur exclaimed joyfully, it's time to act. It works. He can already control the strength of the flame quite accurately. The angel got even more furious and screamed, freak. However, checkmate. After these words, he sent dozens of spears towards the Valfleur, who was surprised at this turn of events. Mori said, these 30 spears of light that destroyed the city. The shaman will die under this righteous reign. The Valfleur waved his fingers, directing all the spears in the opposite direction and protecting himself. He whispered, yes, as they tell him. The flash from the spears flying into the air was so large that it was visible even from the city. Bella looked at this and whispered worriedly, flyer. The man asked to sit his uncle in a certain place and was going to talk through his further actions, but the wound began to bleed even more. The aunt continued to cry, covering her mouth with her hands and whispered, her dear husband. One of the men turned to Prima, who was now tying her hair in a high ponytail, and asked if she could really save him. The second man said, it doesn't seem like the princess has any sense in medicine. Bella watched this tensely and whispered, uncle. Aesher, standing nearby, asked her to calm down, because he would definitely survive. Then Prima put her palms out in front of her and exclaimed, it's time to start. She thought that the Valfleur was trying right now for the sake of all of them. They shouldn't lose face either. The angel's face was now disfigured due to the hellfire. Part of his skin had slipped and covered one eye, and the other was wide open so much that it looked like it was about to fall out. Singed hair stuck out in different directions while drool flowed from his mouth. Mori said, as if an angel could lose to someone like a human. They are the superior race. Valfleur stood in front of him in thought, and Mori is more stubborn than he thought before. Although long-range attacks were a good idea, it seemed that the fire's power had dropped somewhat. The Valfleur then jumped into the air and again began to attack Angel, who did not have time to defend himself. The flames hit him in the face, and he screamed, his eyes. He grabbed the damaged part of his body and howled loudly, while the Valfleur was already raising his fist for the next attack. He thought, in this case, he will concentrate all the fire in his fist and hit the Angel with all his might. More, more fire, tighter, stronger, hot, we need to be even tougher. Suddenly, the face of an unknown fiery creature appeared at his side, which said hotly, but not yet enough. And the Valfleur is pleased with this grain of fire? He is disappointing, such an owner is not suitable for them. The shaman opened his eyes in surprise and wondered who it was. He continued to try to concentrate as much of his power into his fist as possible. However, the creature continued to speak, this was still not enough. Even stronger, even hotter. You need to get red hot. Valfleur's hand began to blaze with flames more intensely. The number one hellfire is Kagatsuchi fire. Even before the Lotus Blossom attack, the angel felt the fire that was scorching him. However, after this attack, he could not hold back the cry of pain. He soon found himself slammed into the ground, in which a large hole formed. Mori was completely disfigured and disfigured. Now it seemed impossible to recognize him. The Valfleur stood in surprise, hearing someone else's giggle and words nearby, he knew it wasn't enough. The shaman looked at his hand and asked in shock what happened now. He lowered his hand, turned his gaze to his opponent, and asked again, seriously, what was that? What he felt now was completely different from what he had felt before when using flames. For a moment something occupied his mind. He remembered the unknown creature appearing next to him and wondered if he had done it. What it is. Could it be, however, his train of thoughts was interrupted by an angel who slammed his fist on the ground and exclaimed, The Valfleur will pay for this. Mori sobbed, lying naked in a hole, and shouted, Yes, so that some semblance of a shaman would defeat the angel. Valfleur chuckled and replied, He really is a diehard. Looks like he's becoming a little fat guy again. And indeed, the Mori began to deflate, soon becoming the same size as it was before. The angel said, let the shaman not think that he will get off easily by opposing the angel. The Valfleur will forget what peace means. His brothers will gather, they will certainly find and kill the Valfleur. He will regret what he did to the depths of his soul. The lowest form, the upstart, who dared to pretend to be. The Valfleur poked him in the forehead and asked him to finally shut up. Mori asked in shock what? Then he got angry and shouted, what is he doing? The angel didn't finish speaking because he received an attack, which made him scream, it hurts. What is this puppy doing? The Valfleur answered with a smile, the spell of caries, stomatitis, stomach ulcers, migraines, and acute gastroenteritis. Let the angel enjoy himself. Mori began to roll on the ground in pain and exclaimed, what? Foam poured out of his mouth and he tried to say, what a shame, with tears in his eyes. The Valfleur happily clenched his fists and exclaimed, great, 
Then he came to his senses and said, Now is not the time to be idle. That man was seriously injured. We should return soon. Perhaps he can somehow help him with his spells. The Valfleur suddenly immediately forgot his joy from the recent victory and exclaimed with concern, The main thing is not to be late. He returned to the site of the destroyed Bakery of Happiness, where now only rubble from the buildings lay scattered. He looked around the corner and asked where everyone had gone. Suddenly a sword was pointed at him, Aesir exclaimed, Princess, let her run, even if for a few seconds she. The knight did not finish, noticing in time who was standing in front of her. The Valfleur lay on the ground, barely dodging the attack. He exclaimed, Aesir, has she gone completely crazy? The knight lowered her sword and said, Flyer, where did the angel go? The shaman replied that he had already defeated Mori. Aesir asked in surprise, was he really able to defeat him? Valfleur said it doesn't matter how it is there. He didn't finish speaking, in shock from what he saw, shouting, what? A man lay in front of him, already in perfect order. Only a hole and dirt on his clothes indicated that he had recently been wounded. Bella hugged her uncle with tears in her eyes. He hugged her back and asked if he had lost consciousness. Why are they all so happy? And indeed, all three men nearby were crying with relief. Valfleur pointed to the baker and asked what? Is he completely healed? How is that? Aesir answered happily, the princess healed him, she is now examining the wounded in the city. The Valfleur asked in surprise, Prima, but how? The princess was nearby at that time, forming a magic Aesir around the injured knee of one of the city residents. She noticed her comrades and exclaimed, Flyer, he's safe. The shaman came closer and whispered in surprise, her hands were glowing. Prima looked at her palms and suddenly exclaimed, oh no, no, all wrong. She started babbling that the Valfleur had misunderstood everything. The shaman did not listen to her and shouted joyfully, It looks cool. Let her show more slowly. Then Aesir hit him on the back of the head and ordered him to stop. The Valfleur rubbed the bruised area and exclaimed irritably, What is she doing? Seriously, let her stop already. Did she want cavities? Aesir exclaimed in response, Let him not poke his nose into other people's affairs out of idle curiosity. People have topics they don't want to discuss. Why is he so stupid? He should be more sensitive to the feelings of others. Then Aisha ran up to the Prima and exclaimed, Princess, she got hurt here, so she asks Prima to do whatever she wants with her body. Prima answered irritably, Aisha, and she's there too. The Valfleur thought about what he heard, sensitive, right? And there is a rational grain in her words. He thinks Aisha is right. Next time, he will be more careful. However, the knight annoys him, so he curses her once. The Valfleur put forward his finger, shrouded in a glow, and directed it towards the Aesir. The next second she grabbed her cheeks and exclaimed, her teeth. Then the Valfleur came to his senses and, ignoring the cries of Aesir that this was all his doing, he asked, by the way, how is Bella? The shaman turned around and noticed her standing on the ruins of the bakery and looking sadly at the sign. The shaman said sadly, yes, the bakery is over. Bella turned around and exclaimed, Valfleur, he lowered his head in shame and asked for forgiveness. If he could have reacted faster, this would not have happened. But this place was very important to her. The Valfleur thought, this is all because they got them into all this. Bella smiled warmly and asked him not to apologize. A destroyed store can be rebuilt. The most important thing is that uncle, aunt, and everyone else are okay. And the words that the Valfleur said earlier touched her to the depths of her soul. She is incredibly grateful to him for protecting everyone. Fleer listened to all this and smiled. The shaman said he can fix the store. Let her ask for whatever she wants. Bella asked again, what? Come on to him. He just wants to do anything and everything. The Valfleur thought, in any case, he's glad that everyone is safe. At this time, someone unknown was watching him from behind a destroyed wall. The Valfleur sensed surveillance and turned around, but did not notice anyone. He asked what? It seemed like someone was watching him now. Bella noticed the change in shaman's behavior and called out to him. He thought, did he imagine? Then the Valfleur turned to Bella and replied, he just thought something was wrong, everything was fine. Meanwhile, the unfamiliar girl exhaled with relief, continuing to stand behind the wall and thought she almost got caught. After some time, construction work continued in the city to fix everything that the crazy angel had destroyed. Uncle crossed his arms over his chest and asked, well, are they leaving already? And he touched her face with a warm smile and said, it will be lonely without them. Prima folded her hands in front of her and exclaimed with a smile, thank them for everything. Aesir and Valfleur stood nearby, smiling, looking at their new acquaintances. Uncle said they could already stay in their city since things are like this. 
The princess replied, no, they need to go to the kingdom of Blue Sapphire, and they no longer want to abuse their hospitality. The ant wished them good luck, after which Aesher did the same. The Valfleur turned to Bella and wished her good luck, she smiled and reciprocated. Soon they walked along the forest path, leaving behind them a family of bakers. Uncle said that's it, they left. And he would have married Belle to that boy if she wanted it. Bella embarrassedly pressed her hands to her chest and asked her uncle not to say that. Then they asked her if she didn't like him. Bella blushed and said, oh no didn't say that, it's just that flyers have their own personal life. Suddenly the girl got scared, hearing the shaman loudly shouting her name. He put his hands over his mouth so he could be heard better and promised to come back to eat the bread Bella bakes again. Until then, may she perfect her baking skills. The Valfleur waved his hand at her with a smile and Bella joyfully exclaimed, good, she will be waiting, thanks to him. She made a mental promise to herself that she would try her best. Soon Aisha exhaled heavily and said, as a result, they never managed to get a horse and they again stomp on their own two feet. The princess answered with a smile, nothing can be done, because of the angel's attack it became impossible to buy a horse. The Valfleur walking in front looked at the girls and said, he likes it. Still, a leisurely journey is the best. He looked at the sky and thought, I wonder who else they will meet. He just can't wait. Some time after the flyer and the girls set off, in the church of the holy angels, namely in the cathedral, a cry was heard, what? More he was. The man was not allowed to finish and answered, yes, mister. Zuriel. The little angel said, the twelfth rank angel named Mori failed the task of eliminating the seventh princess of the White Pearl Kingdom. According to the report, he engaged the princess's bodyguard in battle and was soundly defeated. Mori was able to return on his own, but he was seriously wounded. His throat is badly damaged and he himself is covered in serious burns. It was not possible to ask him about the details. A conversation with notes was also not possible. Mori lay on the bed, covered in bandages from head to toe, so tightly that only his eyes were visible. The little angel added, and from somewhere else he got caries, stomatitis, and other diseases unthinkable for angels. Mr. Zuriel began to pull out his hair out of anger and exclaimed, that's enough, he got it. The princess was supposed to have only a female knight as her bodyguard. How could any human defeat an angel? The highest ranking angel under the twelve apostles, whose name was Zuriel, exclaimed furiously, who would have thought that this task would end in such a failure? And it didn't even go through the meeting of the apostles. If this continues, it will become a problem, and he will have to bear responsibility for everything. The little angel exclaimed with a smile, how? Then Zuriel sat down on his chair and asked devastatedly, but why is it always him? After all, no one ever comes to the meeting. Then he exclaimed again, could it be that fallen angels are involved? The little angel covered his mouth with his hands and answered, There is no mention of this in the report. Then the door swung open, hitting the wall, and a man entered the room. She exclaimed, Zuriel, where is the alder ram? Zuriel looked at the man who entered in shock, and before he was hit, he exclaimed, Lady Gabriel. She asked who he called the old woman. Then one of the twelve water apostles, Gabriel, said, they have an emergency situation, and they urgently need to report everything to Alder Ram. Mr. Zuriel covered his beaten face with his hands and tried to justify himself. He did not say the word old woman. Mr. Alder Baron is currently absent. Gabrielle ordered to urgently call him back in this case. She sat down on the sofa and exhaled heavily. Mr. Zuriel stood next to him in fear and asked, Did something happen? Didn't she just examine Mori? Water Gabrielle said clearly, Mori burns are not simple at all. These words made Zuriel adjust her glasses and ask again, what? Gabrielle continued, the burns were from hellfire, there was no doubt about it. This is all the tricks of the shamans of the gates of hell. Gabriel couldn't believe what he just heard. He exclaimed, what? But wasn't hellfire destroyed a thousand years ago? Gabrielle looked at her palm and replied that if it was just a regular burn, she would have healed it in an instant. However, she cannot do this. This very flame is the only poison for angels. And then Gabrielle folded her hands in front of her and continued to say, they, the twelve apostles, must deal with this. Council of the Apostles. This time they must call everyone. Suddenly someone's voice was heard. Wow, they know how to intrigue. Gabriel and Zuriel turned around in surprise, seeing a blonde guy in a chair. He asked if they could entrust this case to him. He is one of the apostles after all. Zuriel whispered, Mr. Raphael, and thought, his chair was occupied. When did this apostle appear here? The introductory Gabrielle frowned and asked, did he hear everything? 
Raphael grinned and said, This is the same battle with the shamans. A long time ago he missed it because he was slacking a little. Are these types strong? He would like to fight them. Gabrielle replied that if he underestimates the shamans, then nothing good will end. Raphael stood up and said, Let this old woman not be so cruel. She shouldn't put him on the same level as a lower-ranking angel. He may be the youngest among the twelve apostles, but he is absolutely confident in his abilities. If he is allowed, he will demonstrate it. He swung his right hand to the side, causing all the furniture in front of him and the things lying on it to fly to the sides. Gabriel and Zuriel covered their faces, not wanting to get hurt. Then Raphael said, well, something like that. Let them trust him. Has accumulated lately, so it will fall and dissipate in public. It was one of the twelve apostles, the flighty Raphael. He thought about it. Shaman, right? He is all excited. It will be an unforgettable meeting. Sometime later, the Valfleur leaned on his huge bag and exhaled with relief. They've been through quite a bit today. Prima wanted to pour herself a drink, but she suddenly said that there was no more water in the flask. Aesher exclaimed, What? Water is the most important thing. She turned to the shaman and asked, Can Fleer go to the river nearby and get some water, please? He immediately replied, Okay. Soon he was scooping up water from the river with a flask. He thought, From the moment the Valfleur defeated that fat angel, peace and tranquility came. Valfleur said exactly. On the way back, he will need to catch snakes, because Prima really loves to eat them. He's making snake soup for dinner tonight. The Valfleur did not notice how at that time the glowing eyes of a stranger were watching him from behind the bushes. After a few seconds, the Valfleur nevertheless felt someone else's presence nearby and fell silent. He turned around, looking at the bushes, and confidently thought that he was being watched. However, this look is different from what he felt in Western City. The question arose, who is this? Suddenly, someone's paw stepped on the stones lying along the riverbank. The Valfler noticed this and exclaimed, this is it. He didn't finish speaking, and then quickly rushed towards the girls. Along the way he shouted, Prima, Aesher. The knight at this time laughed and said, she will feed the princess, and Prima heard the screams and whispered, flyer? The shaman ran as fast as he could to meet them, which is why the princess asked if Aesher doesn't think that the Valfleur is in a hurry. The knight hissed with displeasure and began to be indignant. She was only finally left alone with the princess. The Valfleur ran closer, stopped and pulled the puppy forward with the words, let them look. Isn't that cute? Prim's eyes sparkled in an instant and she started screaming, how cute. Aesher was not delighted. The princess wondered, where did the baby come from? Valflora said he just met this, can they take the puppy with them on a trip? Prima was already holding the animal in her arms, caressing and stroking it with a happy smile on her face. She exclaimed joyfully, yes. This was followed by the answer of the irritated Aesher, who screamed, no, their journey is not entertainment for them. Plus, now angels are hunting for them. The squatting princess looked at the knight and objected, but this is such a cutie. Valflora also looked at Aesher and said, that's enough for her already. Everyone realized long ago that it would not be difficult for him to defeat these angels. Then Aesher called him stupid. That angel was of the lowest rank. Twelfth, without a doubt, there is a high probability that now higher ranking angels will come after their souls. Prima listened to this and exclaimed irritably, you bastard. Valfleur looked at the princess and said with a smile, Aesher is just jealous of this puppy. And the Prima already loved it so much. Aesher continued anyway. They can't afford to have pets. Let the Valfleur go and take it back to where he got it. Moreover, if you believe rumors, this is where the lands where giant wolves live are located. These animals are incredibly cruel and love to feast on human flesh. Who knows, maybe this cute puppy is their cub. Suddenly the animal began to growl, no longer looking as cute as it did just a few seconds ago. It began to bark at the Aesher and escape from Prim's hands. The knight put his hands in front of him as a defense and exclaimed, what is happening? The Valfleur asked her to look with a smile. This is all because Aesher says nasty things about it. The knight got angry, she just said that they have no right to tame someone they can't take care of. As for her, she also does it with a creaky heart. At that moment, a huge toothy wolf jumped out from behind the bushes, about to pounce on Aesher, who was standing with her back to it. Noticing the danger, the knight exclaimed, Wolf, remember the sun, here comes the ray. The Valfleur hastened to reassure the others, don't panic, he's coming now. The shaman interrupted his speech, looking at the little puppy jumping straight towards the wolf, and he exclaimed, stupid, same. Shock made the Valfleur fall silent, not at all expecting to see how the puppy would suddenly be engulfed in flames, 
turning into a huge fiery animal. The Valfleur exclaimed, what's going on? He couldn't believe it. The dog suddenly burst into flames. Then the shaman turned to Aesir and asked, is the dog on fire? It has also transformed. The knight asked him not to talk nonsense. This cannot be. Then Prima suddenly guessed and exclaimed, this is a sacred animal, the Amaterasu fire dog. The Valfleur was surprised and asked again, is it sacred? The princess explained that there are beasts that can control eight elements of their world, and this is one of them. When it comes to a fire dog, this is the only thing that comes to mind. The dog sank his sharp teeth into the wolf, quickly overcoming it. The defeated animal was bleeding, lying on the ground, and the fire dog walked away fiercely. After a second it barked happily, and then returned to its previous small size. The dog, barking joyfully, jumped into the arms of the Valfleur, who exclaimed, Wow! It came back to them. Prima happily clapped her hands and said, Amazing! She is sure that meeting this baby is fate, nothing else. Valfleur hugged the puppy and exclaimed, They should take this with them, Aesir. Obviously, this animal will be very useful in battle. Prima supported this idea and promised to take good care of the pet along with the flyer. Aesir answered dryly, okay, and the princess and shaman joyfully exclaimed, hooray. They clapped each other's hands while the puppy watched with his tongue hanging out. Then Aesir called out to it and then leaned closer to be level with the fire puppy. She thanked the puppy for saving her. The animal let them know about the danger because it barked. It seems Aesir underestimated this. The puppy has already become a great companion for them. Let this take care of them in the future. Aesir extended her palm forward to stroke the animal but it immediately bit someone else's hand. Valfleur watched what was happening in surprise. The princess pressed her hands to herself in fear, and Aesir fell silent. But this was only for a few seconds, then she screamed loudly and began calling the animal names. However, the puppy did not like Aesir. Meanwhile, Raphael was walking along the corridor of the building and humming a song. He knocked on the massive door, after which he heard the question, who came? Raphael asked for forgiveness and asked if he would interfere. The angel standing on the high stairs and taking many books from the shelves answered, No, not at all. How can he help? Raphael said with a grin that he had a request. He wants his interlocutor to go and, so to speak, poke a stick at one living shaman. He played a big role during the big battle with the shamans, an eighth rank angel named Marcel. These words made him turn around and repeat, Shaman? He hadn't heard this word for a long time. Suddenly Marcel jumped dropping all the books he was holding from his hands. He asked Raphael to rely on him. Marcel did a few tricks in the air and landed on the floor, getting closer to Raphael. He said, they, the angels of the lower ranks, will go into fire and water for the sake of the apostles. The books that had previously been thrown into the air now landed in neat piles on Marcel's two hands and on his head. He exclaimed, he is an eighth rank angel named Marcel, and he will carry out the assignment he has received flawlessly. Raphael smiled and answered, Yes, the kid is loyal, as always. However, doesn't he get tired of constantly moving like this? Marcel put the stacks of books next to him and exclaimed, No. He scrolled again several times and once again answered, Not at all. Marcel began to perform various strange movements, bending over and putting his hands forward. Raphael said that Shaman is now on his way to the Blue Sapphire Kingdom, so we need to hurry. Marcel exclaimed, There is. Then it is sent immediately. Even from the room, the eighth rank angel came out in an unconventional manner, sticking his chest forward and flying out. He broke the window, the fragments of which were now falling inside and remaining on the floor. Raphael was left alone, thinking, this Zhivchik destroyed an impressive number of shamans in that very battle. So Raphael believes Marcel will return with a good amount of information about his upcoming fight. Since he did not participate in battles with shamans, everything should be honest. Okay, Raphael also has a lot of things to prepare. Sometime later, a powerful explosion occurred in the forest, which forced the princess to put her hands on herself, and Aesir looked in horror at what was happening. The Valfleur, meanwhile, exclaimed, Lucky, he got them dinner today. Great, yes, Prima. They will eat kebab from a big snake. At that time, the shaman was standing on a huge scaly monster, which was lying lifelessly on the burnt earth. He turned around, looked at his comrades, and asked what? Is there something wrong? Aesir started screaming, it's not a snake, it's a snake dragon. To counter these magical beasts, the royal family even formed a special unit. The Valfleur took the puppy in his arms and asked, yes. They didn't think it was that much of a hassle, right, Chernui? The shaman pulled the puppy out in front of him, 
looking at it and exclaimed, with the name the pet became even cuter. The dog barked in response, and Prima said, it seems to her, one flyer is already enough to protect her. Aisha heard this and instantly became angry, princess. They had a silent promise. Soon night fell and a month appeared in the sky. Food was boiling in the cauldron, the Valfleur skewered a piece of meat on a sharp stick and handed it to the puppy. He said, let Shernui eat. The snake soup will have to wait a little longer. The puppy barked and began to eat what was given. The Valfleur thought, the girls have been gone for a long time, where have they gone? There is not enough firewood, if they continue like this, the cooking will stop. The shaman asked, well, Shernui, is it delicious? Meanwhile, the stranger stood on a branch of one of the trees, hiding himself under a dark cloak. Unknown person watched the Valfleur and thought, great, they won't notice him here. What a fool he is. Despite the fact that they are being hunted, the Valfleur cooks completely calmly and does not suspect anything. What carelessness, now the stranger will kill him. The unknown man took out a pipe, a silent killing weapon, from under his cloak. I owe just a few millimeters thick, plus it has poisoned needles inside. The target realizes his own death and soon dies. The stranger brought the pipe to his mouth and blew into it, thinking, no matter how strong the Valfleur is, he will not be able to defend against the attack from the blind spot. The Valfleur continued to remain with his back turned to the stranger and stroked the puppy. The needle was almost flying to his neck, which made the enemy think it worked. This man caught it perfectly. However, the stranger interrupted his thought when he noticed that the shaman deftly grabbed the needle with two fingers. This caught the enemy by surprise and made him nervous. The Valfleur was surprised and asked what? Is there anyone here? The stranger mentally exclaimed, this is impossible. Valfleur 100% did not see him. Was it really just reflexes? The shaman brought the needle to his face and smelled it, coming to the conclusion that it was poison. The puppy barked, no longer looking as friendly as it had recently. The stranger hastened to hide, thinking that this was not part of his plans. We need to run away from here immediately. A second later, the Valfleur was nearby, moving along with him. He asked, is the stranger an angel? Why did he target him? Valfleur is just a bodyguard. Wouldn't it be more logical to aim straight at Prim? The stranger became angry, preparing his claws for an attack. He jerked his hand sharply, intending to inflict a wound on the Valfleur, but the shaman managed to dodge in time. He thought, this hand is like an animal, but this stranger is not even close to that fat little angel. The Valfleur looked at the back of the retreating enemy, who thought, now. The shaman put his hand behind his head, holding a sheet with a spell between his fingers, and said, perhaps he understands. This idiot won't run away. He sharply threw the leaf, which turned into a long chain, at the ends of which there were toothy fireballs. This weapon instantly engulfed the stranger, freezing his entire body and making it impossible to move. The enemy fell to the ground with a loud cry, and the Valfleur turned to Shirinui and asked him to call the girls. The puppy yapped back, looking cheerfully at its owner. The Valfleur went forward and exclaimed, playing catch up with him in the forest in the evening is a bad idea. A long time ago, the teacher always suddenly attacked him on the sly, so he got used to it. The stranger continued to twitch and scream, damn it, what is this thing? The player came closer and said, so, it's time to get more information out of him, but before that, where does the stranger hide his weapon? The enemy was scared. Because of this, he exclaimed with a stutter, let them not touch him. The Valfleur said, no, it will have to. Suddenly, he noticed something strange, which made him fall silent. He lifted his cloak so he could see the stranger's body better. The Valfleur asked in surprise breasts, what is his opponent, a woman? She screamed, what a shame. She will never forgive him. The Valfleur said he didn't care, let her give up the weapon she hid. The girl started screaming, he, where did he get into his underpants? Then the Valfleur drew attention to the ears, covered with real hair, that stuck out from the stranger's head. He asked, what is this? Decorations. This is the first time he sees a man wearing cat ears. Now the girl was not wearing a cloak, which is why she could be clearly seen. She exclaimed with flushed cheeks and tears in her eyes, she will remember this for him. She will kill the Valfleur with her own hands. The shaman did not listen to her, completely ignoring the threats he received, and again touched someone else's ears, which made the girl instantly start meowing and get pleasure. He asked, is this her weak point? How funny. Meanwhile, girls and a puppy appeared from the forest. The princess held the hem of her dress and shouted, flyer! Aesher carrying branches for the fire in her hands and asking what happened. The puppy ran bravely ahead of everyone and barked loudly. 
Within a few seconds, Primo was hitting the shaman with a stick and screaming, Flyer, he's a pervert. He tied up the beast's girl and pounced on her. What a horror. How could he? The Valflor covered his head with his hands and asked what she was doing. This girl wanted to kill him herself. And what kind of animal is this girl? Aesher sat nearby, continuing to hug the branches for the fire, and asked what was going on here. The puppy barked at the stranger, who hissed in response. Aesher said that animal people are a race in which part of their blood is animal. No matter how you look at it, this stranger is one of the cat's subrace of beast people. Then Aesher got down on all fours and exclaimed, Princess, she wants to be next. Prima lowered her stick and said, The knight's brains are already completely rotten. The beaten Valfleur stepped aside and whispered whoever there is in the world. Then he turned to the stranger and asked, So what? Why did she target not Prim, but him, when he was all alone? The girl turned her head to the side, thereby showing that she did not intend to answer these questions. The Valfleur thought, looks like this will take a while. Then he invited his comrades to eat first. Aesher stood up, took the brush again and answered, yes, exactly. Let the princess try not to get close to this big girl. Prima heard this, but did not answer, looking at the Catwoman. Very soon the cauldron was practically empty and the fire was extinguished. The Valfleur skewered a piece of food on a sharp stick and asked the stranger to see how beautiful it was and how delicious it smelled. She's not in the mood to talk. Keeping secrets contrary to expectations is very energy consuming, so the shaman thinks that she will soon get hungry. The stranger bit her lips, greedily looking at the food that was brought right to her face. She then closed her eyes and turned her face to the side, causing the Valfleur to ask what. And she's a diehard. Although she is an enemy, her character commands respect. Aesher, who had previously been standing behind with her arms crossed on her chest, said she was thinking, if the stranger was aiming at the Valfleur, then she and the princess had nothing to do with it. The Valfleur exhaled and asked, the knight is determined to leave him here, right? If so, maybe they will tie the stranger to a tree naked. Aesher replied, no, this is too much after all, she is a girl. Valfleur asked if she thinks so and his teacher often tied him like that when he was angry with him. The princess stood nearby, silently watching this. Then she called out to the flyer and said she wanted to ask him for something. The shaman turned around and said yes. Then Prima asked to let the stranger go. These words made the Valfleur look at her in shock and ask what? Char screamed, princess. In no case. She only welcomes those who came for the head flyer, but there is a chance that this girl came for their soul too. The shaman did not like that his comrade spoke so much about his life. Prima smiled and replied, everything is fine. While the flyer is with them, it is obvious which side has the advantage. It is not surprising if a stranger does not want to say anything during interrogation, where there is no guarantee that everything will be fine with her later. She took the stick with food from the Valfleur and handed it to the stranger, asking her to accept it. The Catwoman was surprised, and the princess with a friendly smile asked her not to be afraid. They would not do anything bad to her. The shashlik is very tasty. Let her try it. Then the ropes that had previously bound the stranger's body were torn apart. After a few seconds of confusion, she quietly asked why. Prima still answered friendly, she wants to talk to her. Suddenly, the stick with food was suddenly pulled out from her, which made the princess a little surprised. The cat crawled to the side, beginning to greedily eat the food while the puppy barked next to her. The Valfleur whispered in disbelief, she spoke. Aesher smiled and said contentedly, as expected from a princess. The Catwoman swallowed the last piece of meat and looked around, which the Valfleur noticed and asked her not to do anything strange. The stranger said with a smile, okay, they won, she surrenders. The puppy climbed onto the head of the Valfleur, who exclaimed joyfully, it turned out, prima. This is what a devilishly insidious woman means. Aesher crossed her arms over her chest and replied, exactly. Thanks to her kindness, the princess is able to communicate with commoners as equals. Prima was standing nearby, so she heard everything and asked them to shut up immediately. The stranger introduced herself. Her name is Kiron. She is an assassin, accepts orders from noble people of the Kingdom of the White Pearl. At the moment, she is carrying out an order to eliminate the corpse of the seventh princess of the Primavera. These words made the Prima cover his hand in horror, and Aesir became angry. The princess said she knew it. These were her brothers. Due to her emotions, she was unable to finish, and then, in an attempt to console Prima, the knight whispered, Princess. Curon continued to speak, but now, because they defeated that angel, her mission has changed. Now it is she who must kill the princess. 
Valfleur asked, has she been following them since the moment they met that fat angel? The assassin replied, no, much earlier, from the moment they hired Valfleur as a bodyguard. Prima exclaimed in shock, what? She was next to them all this time. Then why didn't she ever try to kill her? Kiron asked if the princess was even listening to her. Her mission from the very beginning was to eliminate the corpse. There was no word about murder. In fact, she has a principle that she does not accept any additional tasks. However, if she defeated someone who could defeat the angel, then her name would become known. She repents, greed has won. Then the Valfleur finally realized, so that's why she targeted him in the first place. Kiron said that for an assassin, failure in a mission is equivalent to death. At this rate, it will simply be thrown out like garbage. In the worst case, it will simply be eliminated. Even if she manages to escape, her credibility will be destroyed and she will be left without a job. She herself was greedy, nothing can be done. After hearing Prima, Aesher and Valfleur fell silent for a while, pondering the information received. Then the shaman leaned over to the knight and asked, and what will they do? She thought for a moment, and then Prima answered, she will try it. In that case, she hires Kiron. Aesher exclaimed in shock, princess. The assassin meowed, and the princess continued to say, the first task is that she must return to her previous employer and report that she successfully eliminated the princess. After this, Kiron can do whatever he wants. Prima held out her palms, on which lay the jewelry. She asked Assassin to take this royal family member's necklace. If you sell this, you can get about 700 platinum coins. Kiron can use this as proof that she killed her. If the Assassin agrees to Prim's proposal, then she will receive a worthy reward and will be able to maintain her status. What will she say? Kiron looked at the jewelry she was given in shock and then took it and exclaimed, she agrees. She takes this order. The princess, pleased, put her hands to her face and replied, That's great, Mrs. Kiron. The puppy again climbed onto the head of the shaman, who said, To lure the enemy who came to kill to his side and make him his ally, this is what he understands, a real born bitch. The knight exclaimed, Such a princess is also quite herself. She wants Prima to step on her with her pretty feet. The princess ordered them to shut up and then asked Aesher to die. Kiron asked if she's a bitch. Prima exclaimed, No. When Assassin had already climbed the tree and was about to leave, waving her hand goodbye, the princess said that for now the problem with the persecution should be solved. All that remains is to get to the kingdom of Blue Sapphire, and that's it. She relies on the protection of her comrades. Aesher exclaimed, yes, of course. Valfleur, meanwhile, thought with some regret, it turns out that there is not much left to the kingdom of Blue Sapphire. Soon his journey with these two girls will end, right? The shaman looked at Aesher, who was running towards the Prima with her arms open for a hug and shouting, she will be with her forever. The princess ran to the side and asked her to stop. Fleer to the rescue. Suddenly, the puppy felt something was wrong, looking at the Valfleur's hand, which was engulfed in fire. It growled louder, and someone nearby chuckled quietly. 